Do we need to copy that? That would be helpful. Uh, oh, we're on. Oh, good evening. Uh, welcome to the Sherburne Board of Selectmen meeting of December 19th, 2013. Sorry for the delay. We're just waiting for Paul, who's caught in traffic. But we thought we'd get going here uh, while we could. Oh, yes, I have that. Thank you. Um, so we'll start with uh, David reading the agenda first. Sure. First, could, we'll please. consider amendments to the agenda and add topics not reasonably anticipated by the chair 40 hours, 48 hours in advance and public comment period. And then Roger Demler, water commissioner, for an update on a town water district. 645 estimated time for consideration and approval of the following licenses, stable licenses, liquor licenses, class two licenses, and common victual licenses. And then notice of intent, <coughs> Pulte Homes of New England, 190 Main Street, to discuss Street. their preliminary notice of intent. And then following that, administrative reports from town officials, and I'll distribute the, um, the latest version of the notices of intent. Okay. And That's a summary. The checklist, yeah, summary. <coughs> and then um, set the next meeting and then break into executive session um, for the pur purposes of discussing litigation where discussing an open session would be detrimental to the town's position. Great. Thank you for that, David. Uh, Mike, any move to uh, amendments? No. Move to approve. Second. All in favor? Great. Okay, that opens us up for uh, public comment, if anybody has any public comment. Yes, sir, Elliot Taylor. I questioned the uh, town moderator's two-minute limit on people talking at town meeting, which I thought at that time was unconstitutional, and I still think so. My town administrator said he checked in on this, and she does have the right to a two-minute limit, and uh, I think that that is absolutely stupid, ridiculous, outrageous. We'll sit there for a slideshow for some organization, they'll talk for 10 minutes or more, and then when someone gets up, they've got two minutes to either agree or disagree, or whatever. And uh, so I've been told that she has that right, and I will tell you, if you don't let me talk as long as I like, every time is go through the budget, I will say hold on all 50 items. And I've got two minutes for all 50 items to uh, and everything else on the town meeting warrant. I have two minutes. And I will get up and say, I've got two minutes to talk on this. Would you please explain this? And uh, it just, I say it's outrageous, stupid, some more of Massachusetts idiocracy. And uh, so. Uh, well, thank you, Elliot. I, I did not take two minutes. No, thank you. Uh, <laughs> I've been shut off by the moderator once or twice myself, so I understand some of what you're saying. But, David, you. You, you might give us a brief update of the discussion just while he, since Elliot brought this up, just to well, clarify. Basically, the moderator is running the meeting, um, but the proceedings are up to town meeting. No meeting. So if town meeting doesn't object to the two minutes, then that would continue to be enforced by the moderator. Okay. And under st it's under state law that um, no person may address the meeting without being recognized by the moderator and all persons shall at the request of the moderator be silent and the moderator also has the power to order the removal and temporary confinement of persistently disorderly persons okay well that's, that's all provided under state law great okay. thanks for that appreciate as long it as I do it orderly <laughs> that would help Elliot. Yes, that yes that would be help that would be help and don't think I will I understand all right, any other public comment while we're here? Great, I think that puts us right on track for Roger Demler, one of the highlights of the evening. <laughs> and you get to sit in the comfy seat there, Roger, with the uh, microphone. Thank you for coming. I always listen when you talk. <laughs> you don't otherwise? <laughs> Can we cover all three topics? Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, sure, please okay. do. Um, Three things I want to talk about. One is the uh, latest, <coughs> latest report on uh, general chemical spill in Framingham, and then we want to appoint another person to the 
water commission, and then we can talk about what do we do next about water, wastewater, so okay. um, I'll give you the brief thing on General Chemical is just issued a report and a plan for what they're going to do about the uh, spill that they have there. They s are saying that in that neighborhood there's up to 30,000 pounds of uh, stuff they spilled over the decades. And uh, the current plan has been going on forever to try to define where it is, how much there is, and that sort of thing. <coughs> and they've done a, I would say, casual job about it, we think. Uh, a couple of licensed site professionals in town have commented on it recently. Uh, Andrea Stiller and Brian Moore. The town of Framingham has done a great job standing up for us. They have an engineering company looking into it. The federal EPA is now involved, raising comments. Uh, so this is going to go on for quite a while. The next phase has a task in it to decide if anybody's at risk, you know, and this has been going on for 15 years. So. But presently there's nothing really alarming. I mean, we did find some detects in very minute accounts in a couple of town wells, private wells, but, you know, well below standards. Five years ago you couldn't have detected anything at this level. But, you know, we're going to keep pushing on them and see where we get. When you say five years ago you couldn't have detected because we didn't have the technology have the to technology. detect that. You know, we're talking yeah. okay. extremely tiny amounts. Right. But there, we found in Sherborne, or the DEP found in Sherborne, traces of the same chemicals that are in Framingham about a mile away. Yes. And is that the only possible source of those? As far as we know, yeah. There's a peculiar thing that they finally dig it into. There's, there's an, a, the Sudbury Aquifer that goes through town here. It goes right through the General Chemicals yard. Oh, the aqueduct does? Yeah. Okay. And it's brick. It leaks both ways. Right. And, and, <laughs> and they tested the aquifer for the first time in a long time. In this latest round, it found their chemicals right at Course Brook, where there's a some kind of a exit there that probably drains in the course brook when they're not using this thing. So there's a direct path and that the uh, aquifer goes right through the backyard of some of the houses that had some stuff in their wells. Mm -hmm. so. Can this accumulate people? Right. Mm -hmm. Can, can th those things accumulate in, the, in somebody drinking the water? No, it's not like lead or anything like that. It's not a accumulation stuff. But and as I said, the detection levels are like a hundred to a thousand times any kind of hazard we know about. But the DEP, much to my chagrin, has said, well, yeah, we found these things. We spent $20,000 testing, but they're so low that there's no need for us to do up any follow-up. You know, so we don't have any, to the state anyway, any way to find the trends. Is this getting worse? Is it getting better? Is the stuff going away? You know, but, uh, so, 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 no. So are we mostly dependent, Roger, on uh, Framingham for their efforts then if the state's yeah. not planning to do and, much? And, and they're, uh, they've been doing a good job, as you said very, earlier, yes, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so what are the next steps uh, looking forward just to be sure we're um, aware of any issues? The Conservation Commission with Andrea Stiller and then the guy you're about to appoint to be a water commissioner put in some legalized comments. They're both licensed site professionals to commenting on this report that was just published yeah and the federal EPA is also chiming in now and complaining about it so we're in the loop and we keep getting yeah. updates so. yeah and you've been going to the meetings yeah. regularly which we appreciate yeah. Yeah. okay not alarming yet right <laughs> maybe someday um, we're uh, short one water commissioner um, Aaron Fishman retired from the committee, and I'd like to nominate uh, Brian Moore, who we have, we have some detail there, um, to replace him. We've done the proper things by advertising for volunteers and found none, except for Brian that we recruited. He worked on the Downtown Water Study Committee with the Water Commissioners recently. He produced that beautiful map that shows all the overlying, overlaying 
safety zones for all these wells, um, and he's agreed to serve if we agree to appoint him. Well, I think he's a great candidate, but technically, don't we have to jointly meet and vote together with the remaining water commission <coughs> members because they're elected officials as well? I would, um, I would have to check that. Sometimes it's just it may not be joint. If well, it's filling an elected position. I'd be happy to do take action tonight subject to Well, it says right, it says right here the commission and the board are required to agree on a replacement. So No, I understand. We, yeah. We've done that in the past. For instance, mm. we did a board of health appointment, but the two remaining members of the board of health came to a meeting with the board of selection, right. yeah, yeah. and we voted, you know, all five of us yeah. voted together in that one particular case. Well, Daryl and I Versus met. Versus you in guys have met, and you voted yeah. to approve uh, Brian Moore. Right. And, and so, absent specific knowledge otherwise, I'm happy to some, go happy forward to, subject to any other yeah. issues. Yeah, so. if it's proper to, to yeah. do that. Okay. I can, so, I we've, can got, send. we've got the chairman's representation that the, his board has already yeah. voted. Yeah, That's well, right. I'll, I'll yeah. send minutes to yeah. Diane, I guess. So I would move to uh, appoint Brian Moore, uh, water commissioner. And second, and th with thanks for uh, his volunteering. To Absolutely. Do this. Yeah. Uh, any other discussion? All in favor? Great. How's that, Roger? That's good. Thank you. Okay. Um, what do we do about downtown water and wastewater? <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot of people that say, gee, we really ought to have some <laughs> town water down there. It's an extremely complicated thing to go through. Um, I think my position now is I wouldn't recommend we spend any significant amount of money on this because there are a lot of things that we can do ourselves to even decide if we want to do it. We can probably come up with a good answer without spending a lot of money or hiring engineers and that kind of stuff. And I sent sent a list of yeah, tasks. Yeah, that's a great list, great yeah. memo with a great organization yeah. of the different bodies that where they ought to be looking, right. for example, right? Yeah, in the past, the water commissioners who actually have zero authority until the town votes for the water commissioners to do something specific, and we've never had that vote. But um, sort of we've been – water commissioners have been elected since 1914 and never had a specific <coughs> task. But you're so, still very important people. Yeah. Well, I mean, don't. Well. don't. <laughs> no, no so. but here's, here's what would help. See, what I'm getting out of this is there's, we don't necessarily even know all the questions to ask. Not only do we not know what, we don't know what we don't know as well as we need to know what we don't know. Right. How's that? That's well put. Not bad. Sort of. Um, but you've outlined, and if you could just briefly describe what you're talking about. All, all we're, and, and I think just as background, it's not that we're looking to establish public, a, a public water supply in the downtown business district right. or elsewhere specifically, but to be smart and to be forward thinking, yeah. these are the types of efforts that should go forward to be able to come to some more logical or well thought decisions should we yeah. decide to explore that, right. go that route. Okay. How's that, all right? Good. Yeah. Well, uh, Ed Rose started a study in a ad hoc committee of his own a number of years ago that I happened to be on and several other people were on to begin looking at that and got to the point where we said, gee, we, we know well, there's a really good place to put a public water supply well at the end of Morse Road on town land. Looks like it's got the right geography and geology and that kind of stuff and managed to get a small well drilled there and put in and tested it and said, gee, this looks pretty good. It, water's pretty clean, you know, this would be the place to put it. And then the question was, now what do you do? <laughs> uh, so that group came to town and said, you know, this is a really good place to put it. In order to prove that, you want to sink a serious well and put in surrounding wells and pump for quite a while to make sure you're not going to wreck everybody else's well, that the water stays good, that you've got capacity and all that kind of stuff sort of thing and uh, asked the town to approve that and we lost because we couldn't answer all these questions that we're going to talk about. <laughs> we probably should have lost, you know. Um, <clears throat> after that, the uh, water commissioners said, well, there's some things we can do to start filling in the blanks and we pulled what records we could get out of the state on uh, 
all the public water supplies in the, in the town, and what kind of pollution was in them, were there any bad trends, and was anything going sour and couldn't find anything alarming in any of the wells, which is a good thing. Um, and I'll pass these around as a reminder, and then uh, Brian's company volunteered this map where he spotted all the public water supplies in town and all the septic systems and all the private wells in, in the downtown thing and showed that, as we sort of knew, it would be impossible to open any of those businesses down there today mm -hmm. in the current regulations because there's no place to put the public water supply safety zone that can't have any pavement on it, it can't have any buildings on it, and it's going to be on the property of the person that's going to do that. And if you look at the map, the, you know, it's crazy. So um, it was clear that in order to do any development downtown and change any of the uses, you would need some kind of public water supply for sure, and probably septic systems as well. So. We got that far and said, now, now what do we do? Uh, we didn't really have enough ambition to start to put together any kind of an warrant article. And there were a lot, of st lot more work that needs to be done that we couldn't really handle ourselves. So for this meeting, I put together a bunch of notes about things we could do. Mm -hmm. um, and it shows that many other organizations in town should really pick up some of these pieces and do it themselves. Uh, for example, the, I have the selectman down here, as you probably ought to form some kind of committee. You know, we'd happy to be on it, but you, you need to pull together all these other parties <coughs> to make something happen. There are a couple of key legal issues that were raised the last time we tried to do something. One of them was if you put in a water <coughs> district, can you really legally Restrict control it. who can get into that district? Yeah. You know, that sort of thing. Um, and, you know, do you want, what would be the difference between a water department and just an adjunct to the CMD or something to do it? Do you need to do something like that? Uh, the, uh, concern I have for the public buildings is if you look at the usage in this area, almost half of the usage is town of Sherburn town, buildings, you know, yes. So the yep. public needs to know that that's, if you're talking about money, the right. <laughs> town is heavily involved in yeah. being the customer. Uh, there are Apparently, there is apparently some grant, federal grant program for doing this kind of stuff, but I heard second or third hand that we're probably not qualified because we're too affluent. But I don't know. I don't know enough about it to answer that uh -huh. question. Uh -huh. Supposedly, they pay half the cost of these projects, something we could look at. So town council or somebody could dig into those things. Yeah. Uh, the uh, Board of Health has a lot of things they could do to prove to themselves and the public that this is a necessary thing or an important thing to do. Uh, dig up statistics. Uh, one of the concerns that a lot of people had that, is that the businesses in particular have invested a lot of money in new septic systems and new wells over the years and you know their investment would be sort of in jeopardy. Uh -huh. and, my church right across the street here just spent $75,000 on a septic system. <laughs> and if we got plugged into a septic sewage system, you know, that wouldn't have been a good investment. Yep. So it would be good if the Board of Health went through their records and find out what is the age of all the septic systems and the wells and the history of problems with <clears> them and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, in the town as well, has spent a lot of money, spends a lot of money every year, ten, right. fifteen thousand dollars doing water testing and fixing things and that kind of stuff. Put the economics of that together and come to people and say, well, yeah, you just put in a septic system ten years ago. These modern ones are only good for about twenty years. So, you know, by the time we get a new system in, you're probably going to want this. You know, if you can make that argument, you could go a long ways. Um, there are, in order to do something like that, there are a lot of 
zoning regulations that would have to change. You know, right now you're not allowed to share wells, you're not allowed to put a septic system in somebody else's property, you know, yep. so that somebody needs to go through that and find out what the impact would be. Uh, try not to go into too many details here. But, yep. uh, the uh, planning board has done work in this area and, and said if, did this study, it says what, what impact does the current limit on water and wastewater have on development? And they said if we hit, did a full build out without any restrictions on water or wastewater, zoning regulations and whatnot, they could probably double the floor area. It's kind of an optimistic kind of number, but they could probably double the floor area of the commercial businesses downtown, which would generate at least twice as much taxes. Tax revenue, sure. And, <laughs> and probably the assessments would go up proportionally because right. I know downtown businesses, when they want to sell, have a very difficult time getting buyers and that sort of stuff. So, so it would be good for the planning board to go through a more detailed study about what could really happen and recommend places that would want development, perhaps they're the best place <coughs> to have them answer the question, where would you put a uh, waste treatment facility if you wanted one? Uh, that kind of stuff. The uh, conservation would obviously get involved because if you want to use that well, you'd have to get state approval to change the regulations and at least allow uh, public water supply in a conservation area. Mm -hmm. And uh, they probably have a lot to say about where you put a put a uh, septic field and that kind of stuff. Um, and then this committee collectively should go through all this, figure out what the risks are, and finally decide, do we want to do anything? Right. And if so, what? And at that point, you might start hiring engineers to you know, do an that kind of stuff. So there's a lot that can be done. It's not going to happen before town meeting, <laughs> that's for sure. Uh, uh, <laughs> understood. So, so uh, th this is a good <coughs> outline of the problem and some of the things that could be studied. I wondered if the problem was framed a little bit differently, would we still have the same approach here? For example, if, if the proposal was let's figure out what we would need to do to get water here uh, in you know over the next two years or three years and what the timetable would be in leading up to a town meeting vote and implementing it I think some of these things would need to be done maybe maybe in a different order um, you know we can all we, we can always vote no I think the town's pretty good at voting for no change yeah. this would be a big change but as you pointed out until there's water in the center of town there's not going to be any growth in the center of town, and there's not even going to be any stability. I mean, the, mm -hmm. those properties are sad, a lot of them. Yeah. Um, and so I guess I, I would wonder if there's a, uh, uh, you know, a potential effort of actually putting forward a positive proposal to say, let's figure out how to do water in the center of town. I don't know if it has to be accompanied by septic. I, I can see the reason why it might be better to do it that way, but I know there are towns that have one or the other and and not necessarily both. Um, but anyway, that's I, I think you did a, a, a brilliant job of, uh, you know, extracting the, the issues right. that we, we have to think about. I mean, this is, on the surface, it seems like an easy question. It's not an easy question. There's a lot of different dimensions to it. And thank you for that. Yeah, um, I understand where you're coming from. I, <coughs> my attitude was when I was doing this, let's not jump into this with insufficient information and get turned down again because that may be our last mm -hmm. chance for a decade or something like that. A lot of these questions, financial questions, we can probably come up with a pretty decent answer because we know we have a ballpark figure of what it would cost to put in the water system. We're through the uh, that study we're doing with smart sewering, we're going to have a ballpark number on what a conventional packaged uh, waste treatment plants going to cost, roughly. Yep. 
and from that you can go through the apportionment of who pays for it and what what kind of betterment fees people are going to have to pay you know and if you get through that you might decide gee this is never going to fly mm -hmm. or it might I don't know but I think in order to sell this you, you want to go through this exercise and say okay you know the average homeowner downtown is going to get a uh, probably a betterment hit on his tax bill for 10 years or something like that of an extra 500 bucks and he's going to be paying 200 bucks a year to me for his water <laughs> that kind of stuff and get the practical numbers for these people to mm -hmm. deal with so one of the key takeaways i guess roger from you in terms of looking for action of yeah. some sort is the recommendation that, that this body create some sort of committee that pulls mm -hmm. tries to pull all of these various pieces of information together in some manner yeah, and so right. that's something for us to think about and maybe look deeper and come up with a structure of something if in <coughs> fact we want to do that and, and, you know I don't envision trying to do something like that this evening but I think uh, <laughs> yep. we would uh, look Especially forward to doing that late. Well, I don't think, missed, I don't think we do missed that. all yeah. your good 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 information here <laughs> but but that's one of the main takeaways yeah. is that it needs a body of volunteers to, mm -hmm. to really look at this hard, even though already there's been all sorts of folks looking right, at different elements of this. Haven't pulled the, it together. The key is yeah. pulling it together at and, this and, stage of the game. You know, and, and that's, it, I, I do frame it a little bit differently. I think <clears throat> we're going to be really great as a town and as a town meeting at figuring out how to kill a yes. water plant if people want to kill a water plant. What we're not so great at is figuring out how to do it. Mm. And so. If, if we can figure out how to do it and if we as a committee can charge a committee with coming up right. with a plan to do it, now it may not fly, they may not have a con convincing argument in the end, but you got to go through most of these steps that Roger laid out, but I would hate, to, I would hate it to be an abstract study committee. I think I e even if we haven't oh, decided yeah. that it should be done, I think we should charge a committee with figuring out how to do it. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I agree with you. I think. You don't want to have a missed opportunity because we didn't do it right. I, yeah. yeah. And the water commissioners are happy to keep working on this, even though we're not authorized. <laughs> in a sense. Well, there's no restrictions on what you're doing. That's right. That, huh? That's the best part. Um, and, so I think that's food for thought. I think you'd be very valuable working with David with some, if you're interested, sure. with coming up with some approach that reflects yeah. the discussions we've had and what Roger's providing us. I think that sure. would be very useful and then we take that up at a future meeting and try to move forward rather than you know sit and yeah. let time pass All right. you know I, I must say that Brian <clears throat> only agreed to be on the water commission if we could work on a water wastewater projects there you go try to make some sense of that <laughs> well that's not uh, the deal we made with him <laughs> <laughs> oh <laughs> No, so that's great. Uh, any questions from, uh, yes, sir, uh, Elliot, I saw your hand, and then Tom, I'll get yeah, to you. Comment. Did you say Sherman was an affluent yes. town or an effluent town? <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, I like it. I think, uh, Enough of your <coughs> I think what we need to do is find out what would it cost to put in water and or sewage. That's what mm -hmm. Roger just said. Yeah. And how much to maintain it, mm -hmm. and what would the payback be if we did expand uh, yeah. uh, in, let's say, commercial? And uh, I don't think that uh, you'd get the payback. Uh, I don't know, but uh, my gut feeling is it just won't pay back. I don't know either. Uh, I, I doubt I very much. <laughs> we need to know. We yeah. want yeah. And I, people who have built new houses or refurbished old uh, water septic systems have spent what thirty, fifty thousand dollars perhaps, yeah. and I don't think that they want to get an addition on their tax bill so that other people can have town water and sewerage. So uh, I don't know. These are yeah. just some questions. Your points. Tom in the back. Uh, Roger, just your gut feel. Uh, two questions. Um, 
MWRA was in here about three or four years ago. Right. Uh, made a presentation. What's your uh, what's your sense of the consensus among people who have sort of focused on this closely um, as to uh, the advantages of that option versus uh, going with uh, the Morse Road, uh, having our own supply and the infrastructure that that would require. <coughs> The advantage of the MWRA is that they already have a water quality system and, and uh, that kind of stuff. And they're desperate to sell water because they fix all their leaks and now they have too much water. Um, one of the big drawbacks is the closest place you can get to is in Framingham. And uh, Framingham would pass water through to us probably. You know, we've had that conversation a little bit. But it's, what, two and a half, three miles of pipe and there's you blow a couple million dollars in piping just to get the water downtown um, there's can i add something to that absolutely. yeah there's not but, only the um <clears throat> the cost of the piping but there's like that quote unquote buy-in cost to get into yeah mwra where there's a question mark where if you're not one of the original communities that was involved in mwra you need to pay a fee to join so hmm. that those Five towns million. can recoup the what Five million. <laughs> That's quite if it's feet. five million, then it's yeah. Yeah. kind of. Also, a if you're coming over from Framingham, depending on how you come in, but I would imagine it's over the <clears throat> the hills. Uh, you're going to be blasting to get those pipes in the ground. Yeah, I mean, on the surface, to me, what I I was thinking would be the best thing is a self-contained water district under its own board of directors, mm -hmm. not the town. Yeah. But that's what we we yeah. toss back and forth, and uh, and and we're still. I still think of a water district that's a legal boundary right, that right. protects the rest of the town from <laughs> expansion. <laughs> expansion. Mm -hmm. uh, it's conceivable we could get water from uh, Natick. Once upon a time, they offered us water because they wanted to have a close a, a loop that came through town. Uh, we haven't talked to them recently about that, but they had their own problems. But again, there's a long pipe system involved, but certainly that's something we should look into. Okay. Um, Secondly, um, uh, do we do water by uh, initially or septic initially, or is it is there some reason, gee, we really have to do both sides of the equation at the same time in terms of not only the <coughs> planning but the implementation? Is that uh, is that generally the consensus? There isn't a consensus. Um, it's. Most of the people, when you go through all the details, don't have an opinion one way or the other. If you start with a, the minimum incentive is what do we do to, what's the best thing we can do for security of the water supply downtown? Probably you do a septic system so that doesn't pollute the local wells. If you want to uh, increase development, you might want to do the water side of it first. If you want to do safety and growth, you do both. Okay. Um, we have this trihydrant system that runs through town that really makes the water thing quite a bit cheaper than the septic system. But there isn't a consensus. We go back and forth on so those what's are the, the most important. To uh, yeah. ask of this uh, yeah. potential group, yeah. Yeah. Bob, you had a question. But, oh, but what? Right. There seems to be agreement on. If you decide which one you want to do first, if you want to do one thing at a time, you should spend enough engineering time to say, okay, if you do water, where do you put the waste system later so that you don't wind up tearing up the streets twice or you don't yeah. preclude doing something with water? So. Okay, Bob. That's the point uh, that uh, the as to the cost. I mean, as you pointed out, Roger, uh, well, every, all the users would have to pay, uh, but uh, offsetting that would be uh, uh, their ability to sell the properties right. uh, at a better price. Yeah. Uh, grand, their taxes are going to be higher, but uh, it would seem to be the, that there's two sides to that issue, that yeah. uh, it could possibly significantly enhance the value of people's property. To some some people's detriment, right? 
Well, but I, th I think your point is well taken, Bob, be in a different way than it would be with a resident who had just spent $50,000 mm -hmm. on a new septic system because yeah. you can increase the development on a site if it's connected to sewer or connected right. to water, which you can't do just because you have a brand new uh, septic system or well. Yeah. So. I, I heard that the house we bought next door here was appraised, and the appraiser said unofficially that if this thing had town water and sewer, it would be worth another $100,000. Mm-hmm. Paul, do you have any? Yeah, just a kind of. It would be a native. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Just a comment, if I could, on a couple of things. First, I think we all believe in having a vibrant downtown. Mm -hmm. And I think we all are in favor of run, some kind of renovation and renewal and growth in the downtown area. If that happened, we would better serve our residents with the services that one gets from the downtown area. We would be healthier and safer mm -hmm. if we address the water and sewer issues. We would improve the revenue side for the town. As we look at that we've been talking about making improvements in the downtown area for 10, 20, or more years. It's been a, a constant goal to, to achieve that. The main restrictions have been the water and the sewer. There's some complications with zoning too, but mainly water and sewer. And for that, that's a function of cost. It's always been expensive to find a solution. Mm -hmm. At the state level, there's a bill working through the legislature that would fund these kinds of projects to 50%. As I look at the downtown area, if you include Pine Hill School in this, they, that takes about half the demand that's currently needed for that whole area. We might be able to fund our piece of it through this new legislation. Mm -hmm. And so the taxpayers might be able to emerge fairly intact, mm -hmm. but there would have to be a a betterment district, they would have to be a water district, they would have to be a sewer district. And the best way to create those is through a uh, home rule petition mm -hmm. and an act of the legislature that would create these boundaries. One option we've used in other communities <coughs> is to have the legislature authorize the community through town meeting to adopt bylaws defining the districts. Mm -hmm and making a plain that if you're in the district, you're entitled to these benefits, and if you aren't in the district, you're not entitled to the benefits. So there's, there are solutions out there, mm -hmm. and part of it is putting all the pieces together and deciding now is the time. Mm -hmm. Because there have been studies in the past. There have been people with good ideas about this in the past. There has been a lot of work by yourself included, mm -hmm. but a lot of other people. The planning board has put a lot of work into this. Yeah. There's, been, there's been a lot done. Mm -hmm. So to some extent, it's, it's a question of you know, when do you sound the charge and go for broke mm -hmm. on this? Well, I think Maybe not one, one message I have is, <laughs> pulling all this stuff that's been done together and doing some more work on the side so you have a a good I don't want to say story you have a good set of facts together to say this is what's going to happen you know, right. plus or minus a yep. few things but in <clears throat> order to sell it because you're going to have this pushback from the town people who say I don't want to pay for any downtown water and that kind of stuff but we don't know what that's going to cost them and until we get there, but again, I don't think they we don't can have sell. to pay for it because we, we there's this new grant program that's I, I am projecting is going to pass. Okay. 
if the townspeople don't have to pay it through their taxes, and in fact they will see tax benefits because as revenue is course, generated yeah. through taxes in the downtown area, then there's less pressure on everybody else. Everybody would benefit from this. The businesses downtown would benefit. Right. The rest of the community would benefit financially. And plus, you'd have better services downtown. So we're at the point where I think that the argument can be made that this may be the time or it may be, the next but few we years. Don't, we, don't have, the, we don't have the story put together yet. Yeah, and so I think where we're at, Roger, is the game plan is to come up with a game plan to yeah. have a, create the game plan. Yeah. How's that? Right. That makes sense. Almost. Huh? Sort of scary that it makes sense. Kind of makes sense. I, think, well, I think there's been another uh, element at work, too, which is the concern that taking water to the center of town means you've turned Sherbert into a town that has public water throughout the town or that people could insist that water be extended here, there, and everywhere. And one, one question would be about this well uh, at the end of Morse Road. What kind of production does it have? Is it, is it a well that would serve more than just the center of town? Probably not. So, I mean, maybe that's a self-limiting uh, right. factor that helps with that issue, too. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, one, if you wanted to spend money, one thing you would do is go in and put in a proof well there, what runs at design capacity and finds out how much it, sure. it works and it does it wreck other people's wells. It's, it's a pretty expensive thing to do. Yeah. But that's the first thing you would do. Good. But that's the problem. Uh, with doing our own water supply. First, it's expensive to bring a new well online. A lot of engineering, a lot of permitting, a lot of permitting and expenses. But then you also have to set it up so that the water is healthy and it's tested and it meets all these requirements. The beauty of the MWRA water is it already comes clean. It already comes healthy. It already has all the labs done, all the testing done, all of the quality stuff done, all the permitting has been done. It's all, the investment's already been made. That's why there's a, a buy-in fee mm -hmm. here for the MWRA. But the state will now pick up half the cost of the buy-in fee for the MWRA. So all that kind of story will come out of the fact-gathering yeah. and educational process that right. uh, we could go through. I think the MWRA through, opens so. it right back up to the question of yeah, the town. Out our zoning and, yeah. and but that's why you want a statute. You, you want to start with a home rule petition that creates a district. A limited district. All right, Roger. Uh, I'm going to move along here. I okay. uh, really appreciate your uh, yeah, time, thanks, and you've, you've stimulated us to take some action here. So, And I appreciate that Mike's going to volunteer to work with David as we move forward to figure this out. Okay. Oh, and you got the maps. Th thanks, Roger. There you go. Yeah. Thank you. Did we elect the water commissioner? Yes. 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 Yes, we did. Thanks again, Roger. <clears throat> okay, next up, I think we have uh, 800 permits to approve in the next five minutes. Um, and it depends on Jeannie, I guess. So in this, Jeannie, you know, I had some questions. I think Mike had some questions. Um, I see we've got some new information from Walter, which is terrific. That's very helpful. Um, the question is whether some of those questions are answered well enough so that we can approve and sign all of these things tonight. Okay, ask away. Should we do them in order of this listing here, stables and then liquor and then sure. class? Sure, sure. So we have stables, Jeannie, and uh, the question, I had questions. One question was uh, what we were doing, and you've got information that clarifies that. I had just the basic question. We have 223 stables at 15 locations, and we did them all in one four-hour period with three inspectors. How do we do that well, was just a question I had. 223 stalls. Stalls. Okay. There's a uh, distinction. Well, <laughs> yeah. The, um, the stables are done by the fire chief, yep. the building inspector, and the yep. wiring inspector. They choose one day. It takes them approximately four hours to go to each one. They all go with a site, uh, checkoff sheet. Yeah. They look at the, what they're in charge of, um, and they're able to do it very efficiently in those four hours. Okay. The animal inspector goes out. and she This year, she got her memo on November 6th. 
she doesn't do it all in one day because she also inspects for cattle yep. and other things. And yep. she brought me in for this. She checks to make sure that there are enough stalls and shelter for every horse. Yep. And she comes back, and there were a couple of questions this year. And we um, contacted the stable owner, and they agreed to reduce the number of horses. Okay. Um, we have uh, just a, just a simple form question. We have an application for horse stable license, but nowhere does the applicant actually sign off on the thing and says, I apply. It's they not. do fill it in. If it's something you want, I can yeah, add for to the it future. Next year. Yeah, that's just something to consider fine. for the future. That's Gene, all. Gene, do these all have zoning approval? The ones that require zoning approval, do they all have zoning approval? Uh, the only one that requires zoning approval is 256 Western. We pulled that one for tonight okay. because um, they weren't home for the inspection to be done. Okay. okay. And we have a memo that says what we did from the building inspector and we saw the fire yeah. chief's uh, information. So we're good to go. Um, there good. was one question on one that was still open, I think, for some wiring issue wiring or something it was a uh, fire extinguisher okay and that was uh Has that been resolved 188 maple and that's not in your package oh so we're not signing that one you're not signing okay and Paul, you had questions? No, no, oh, I'm you're all good? set to let's, rock and roll. Let's go forward. Which is which? Hey, Gene, Gene, one other question on this sure. one. 113 Western is signed by the contractor. Is there a reason it's for that? signed by the contractor. Well, that's what it he's says, I think. Owner. He's the homeowner there. Yeah. So he's signing on a contracting address, but it's okay. Right. Got it. Good. Great. And um, we do all this for a $20 fee, so that's, that's something for future fee. Uh, okay, very good. <laughs> We, we can actually charge more than the $20 fee. We can? Yes, yeah. There's in a statute that says <laughs> chapter 40, 22F. All right. Well, so, that should be part of our fee discussion when we uh, that's right. get to that. I just point that out uh, for future discussion purposes. So, how, how should, uh, gentlemen, how would we like to do this? I'll name each one, uh, the number of horses. I'll read them all off, then I'll ask for a motion for approval of the batch that I've read off, and then I want to we'll know the names of the away. horses too, Peter. Okay. <laughs> all right. We have uh, Wilbur, and then we have Mr. Ed here. At, uh, then we have Jennifer Clues, 125 Mill Street Stable for eight horses. We have Helen Kurtz, Mount Misery Stable, 34 Great Rock Road, Stable, 12 horses. Uh, we have Deborah Green, Green Hills Farm, 51 Whitney Street Stable, 38 horses. We have uh, George Fisk, Bogostow Farm, 12 North Main Stable, 30 horses. We have Jane Elias, Trinity Stable, 65 Farm Road, Stable, 10 horses. We have Mary Barbara Alexander, 127 Farm Road, Stable, 7 horses. We have Beth Snyder, 130 Nason Hill Road, Stable, 6 horses. We have Susan Bernard, Greenwood Farm, 42 Washington Street, Stable License, 10 horses. We have Lee and Elaine. Chair Tavian, I apologize if I mispronounce. 12 Ames Drive, stable license, 10 horses. We have Matt Mayo, Corsebrook Farm, 39 Brush Hill Road, stable license, 45 horses. We have Sandra Niles, Long Run Farm, 70 Bullard Street, stable license, 10 horses. We have Patricia Michaud, 12 Meadowbrook Road, stable license, 4 horses. We have Patricia Michaud, 111 Coolidge Street, stable license, 26 horses. And finally, we have Pedar Hardeman, 113 Western Half, stable license, eight horses. So I'll take a motion to approve all of those. To approve. Uh, second. Second. All, any other discussion? <laughs> all in favor? Here we go. We'll sign away. And uh, how about that? I'll turn them to my left. Okay. Sorry. All right, Jeannie, while we're doing this, we'll multitask. Well, uh, what's up next on the uh, agenda list there of liquor licenses? Sorry, I keep turning them over. That's next on the agenda. That's, I just we just wanted to stick to that if we could. So if you read off the names, I'll move approval. Did I have questions on those, Jeannie? Uh, there was one where somebody didn't sign. That was, think, uh, that was for the... Um, Victualer. That was for the Victualer. That was uh, the Sherbonne didn't check retail. You know, we need a <coughs> runner here. You, you just quit them above us. 
All right, let me ask that question. Now. Let me just look at my notes there, Jim. We should be proud and encourage the stable, the stables in Sherburne. It's part of the character of the town. It's, it's a lot of a long them. tradition here, wow. Sherburne. All the horses. <coughs> All right, this is the next one here, Jeannie. This group. Okay. You had a question about the uh, workman's uh, comp or something. Uh, and one of these, somebody didn't sign. <coughs> that's us. Didn't, didn't sign. All right, so we're going to. Get that right. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'll read those out. Read those out. We have Sherburn Fuel, LLC, DBA, Sherburn Market, Laura Weatherall, Manager, Sherburn Fuel, LLC, DBA, Sherburn Market, Laura Weatherall, Manager, Sherburn Fuel, DBA, Sherburn Market, Laura Weatherall, Manager, is a retail package goods store. Alcoholic beverages. Alcoholic beverages. This one's. 1760 Society Inc. Philip Coco Manager for the Sherburn N33 North Main Street. Uh, we have retail package goods store. 1760 Society Inc. Philip Coco Manager for the Sherburn Out. We have uh, retail package goods store. Watkins Group Inc. DBA Sherburn Wine Spirits. Rob Watkins Manager. I think that was one I had a that question was the on. One that you wanted to know what they, um was, was on the okay. Yeah, so they so just didn't fill that, that out. Okay. And we have a renewal. We have to sign this is what yeah. you want us to sign? That's good. Okay. Just no All right. So I'll take a motion to approve those that I read uh, as a group. I'm, I move to approve the to, to approve the renewal of the licenses with the same conditions, terms, and hours of operation as are set forth in the licenses. Okay, very good. I just just a, a question on that, Paul. I think didn't we vote at our last meeting to allow extended hours on New Year's Eve for one of these yes, licensees? Sure so it would not that would not uh, overrule the the vote we took. Yeah, no. I'm time. just like if you look at this, it says 800 feet to be used or 200 feet. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the first one 200 square feet. So 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 you, when your motion says the hours of operation on these licenses. licenses, it would be subject to the previous uh, vote we had, or maybe we should just include it as part of this vote that we were extending the hours for New Year's Eve on the Sherburn Inn. Well, I don't recall having voted to extend their hours. I thought I thought we had decided to defer. We, we did subject to, to signing off on these, right. I think, is what yes. we yes. did. So it's a circular thing. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we already heard the opposition to it. But I, I don't remember whether we actually voted or, or we just had We did, but I, I don't think it would hurt to amend your motion to say and the special hours for New Year's accepted Eve. Accepted as okay. part of the motion. You seconded that? Second that. Any other discussion? Yes, Elliot, I'll yes. Uh, quickly, please. 30 years ago. That's nothing new, Elliot. I don't care if it's new or not. You're let's let's just move on. All right. Uh, I was assured there'd be no lights shining under my this. house from the Sherman Inn. This was before the place was built. It was also agreed that there'd be no outdoor entertainment at the Sherman Inn. There has been outdoor entertainment at the Sherman Inn. There are now, tonight, there are nine lights shining on my house. They're not shining on your house. I'm sure if they were, you would have had them uh, taken care of years ago. But uh, so until these lights uh, no longer glare on my house, they can put little shades on them so they don't glare across. On your way home tonight, please drive by and you count them. Uh, we won't worry about the Christmas tree lights, but uh, these lights glare on my house and I've objected to it before there were lights. I told him, don't shine lights on my house. Oh, we're going to plan them lights. Okay, Elliot. You should well, number I these, Elliot. It. Elliot, just number these and just tell us number three. And then it's a lot shorter and we can move on to the rest of our business. I you have about ten you, of these speeches. I just a, number them. I have the floor. Please don't interrupt me. Please. It would be useless to do so, Elliot. Go ahead. I know. I know. You're a useless punch. But Elliot, uh, that's Elliot. The way no, 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 Elliot. Elliot, now, please understand, now, Elliot. I am opposed to the Sherman out 
and the Sherman Inn having any licenses until these lights and a, a no, don't glare on my house, and I'm assured there'll be no outdoor entertainment at the Sherman Inn. Okay, Elliot, thank you. Now, you understand, Elliot, you, I call on you because I like to listen to what you have to say, but if you keep repeating yourself like that, we're going to have difficulty with that. This so I'm just asking you to respect that we do listen to what you say. We understand it. You, ha you make valid points quite often, but if you keep repeating yourself and tying us up, and tonight we have a very, very difficult schedule ahead of us. I'm through talking. Get I'm, just, I'm just letting you know this, Elliot, so that we're clear between ourselves, okay? Well, I have a right Thank you. To be here. All right, so it's been moved and, and seconded. Uh, all in favor? Aye. All right, we're going to sign these off. Thank you. There's one mic. Uh, yeah. I'll have to sign one of the two places okay. on this. Oh, I'm sorry. We both signed two places. Okay. Yeah. We both signed two places, and then I signed we'll one, Jeannie. Well, you can all sign the third one. What's the third one? Where do I sign yeah, on okay. that? Looks we'll like an insurance. Thing. That's an insurance thing. Yeah. So You're not giving them insurance. No. <laughs> we signed this. This and that. But there's one of these. There's, there's this. That fell off, I think. This. Do I sign this? No. Okay. I understand that. So these two. Okay. Yeah, no, I got to get through all these things. Yeah. Thanks, Gene. While you gentlemen are signing those papers, I do want to apologize for being late. I was tied up in traffic. I apologize to everybody. Well, it just isn't the same without you, Paul. I uh, mm -hmm. left my office at 4 o'clock and two hours and a half later, getting through the intersection. Coolidge Street, and really? before that, the uh, exit 30 on the Mass Pike. <coughs> Seemed like everybody was heading to uh, yeah, the Yeah, the mall. Yeah. Again, yeah. I know everybody's time is valuable. I, I regret being like, okay. no disrespect was intended. Okay, thank you. Do we... Would you sign this too? Yes. Right, Jeannie, we all sign this one sheet here. Right, whatever that is. Great. Okay, what's up? And then, up? Jeannie, you type this all in. Is that okay? Class two licenses. Class two licenses. Oh, is that licenses. the ones that are given up? Okay. Class two licenses. Three of them. Okay. We have a. Uh, so I'll read those off, gents, if that's all right with you. Please. While we're multitasking here. Did the police chief sign up on that? The police chief, we discussed it today in David's office. There have You've been no complaints. Please find it. All right, here we go. Uh, class 2, we have used car dealer's license for Sherburn Auto Brokers, 27R North Main Street. Um, we have... Likewise, one for Sherburn Auto Sales, Jason Walker to Vincent, 27R North Main Street, Unit 2. We have uh, the third one, Roses Automotive, Inc., 26 North Main Street. Um, I'll take a motion to approve all three of those. I move and that these we are through uh, for expired January 1st, 2015. Just for curious, where's 27R North Main Street? It's um, uh, Paul. Um Paul the insurance? insurance. Okay. They came in from the DBA for the yep, yep. office and the signage in the back. And that's what's in there? Yeah. Okay. So can I move that the licenses be renewed with the same terms, conditions, and restrictions as are presently contained in the existing licenses? Okay, great. Do I hear a second on that? Um, second. Do you have any questions? No, but I think we have public comment. Public comment, we do. Yes, sir. Public comment. I'm opposed to Rose's garage being <coughs> given any permits. He has bright lights behind his garage that shine on my house, my barn, and my yard. I've spoken to him about those lights. They shine on, and I'm opposed until he takes those lights, shines them back toward the hill, and not toward my house. I'm opposed to Rose's having any permits until he corrects this problem. Thank you, Elliot. Am, am I really asking too much? On that one, that was fine, Elliot. That was fine. That was Thank, you. Thank you. 
Any other comments? I think there's somebody in the audience. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, Grace. In relationship to that, they suggest you assign a person the responsibility to go out and review Elliot's comments and we, see just uh, I have that's a good suggestion. I have looked and I think that someone else should look and see what they think is actually happening. Yep, that's when the we function of the building inspector. Exactly. Yeah. When we received okay. Elliot's first complaint, it was assigned to the building inspector and we are waiting for him to get back to us. But I don't have anything to report, so. We, we treat. Rose's, Rose's light go off at 7 o'clock at night. We, we treat every complaint seriously. I'm just, I'm just, we don't, yeah, we don't ignore years. anything. We give it to the professionals. We have them look at it. If they find a problem, they take appropriate steps. If they find there's no problem, they so indicate. Doesn't bother them. No problem. Okay, so it's been uh, moved and seconded. Any other discussion? All in favor? Great, so I'll sign off on these. Sorry, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I hope we're getting you all this paperwork back in order, you know. It's okay. <laughs> Here's a Older here of something, I don't know. Janie's pretty smart. She, she should figure it. it out. She's good at don't it. Don't underestimate yeah, it. Yeah, 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 I hear you. <laughs> Me too. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> Me, I'm going to give you these folders, and we have one more to do, which is the okay. common victuallers yeah. license. I don't believe I had any real questions. There was one that didn't sign the lower right of this. Is that right? Make sure that You'll make sure that happens. Yeah. Okay, so let me read those out. CNA Lewis Inc. DBA CNL Frosty 27B North Main. Uh, uh, Philip Coco, manager of the Sherburn Inn, 33 North Main Street. Uh, okay. uh, Laura Weatherall, manager for the Sherburn Pizza, DBA Rustic Pizza, 21 South Main Street. David Wilson, DBA, the Sherburn Sandwich Shop, 11 South Main Street. Uh, Sherburn Donuts, DBA, Dunkin' Donuts, 21 South Main Street. And I think that's everybody, right? Okay. Uh, I'd move approval with the same terms, conditions, and restrictions as are currently contained in the existing license. Sorry? Do I hear a second? Second. I just want to make sure we've got them yes, set up please. right because yep. the back of the CNL package I have contains the rustic pizza application. I just yeah, mine sure had the we extra them. piece. Okay, that's so right. we're signing in. We're, we're signing with the original the form. The one that's got the right form on it. That's correct. Okay. That's correct. Okay, uh, any discussion? Well, under discussion, these, these licenses provide economic opportunities, jobs, and services to our communities and our residents. And we should be supporting them and renewing the licenses. And if, if there are any issues with any licenses, there are ways for, for uh, appropriate town officials to address that with them and allow for them to be corrected without shutting down important Totally agree. Businesses. My questions were more just format things and so forth, so uh, that's all good. So it's uh, been moved and seconded. All those in favor? Great, here we go. Support your local merchants. Yes. Yeah. Buy right. local. And there's quite a variety when you get to looking at these and you're signing them off. Quite so a variety. Oh, and these common victuallers pay uh, meals taxes That's to right. the town. <laughs> Elliot, we, at least we keep you illuminated, Elliot, huh? Yeah, okay. That's right. You're not in the dark, my friend. <coughs> Never in the dark. All right, we got through this, Jeannie. Thanks. Yay, Jeannie, nice job. Yeah. I think we got one more to yeah. sign. It's the uh, holiday season, and let there be joy and, and civility donuts. and yep, all the goodwill towards everyone. That's right, do your shopping. <laughs> Do shopping in Sherburn. There you go. That's right. Exactly. Okay. Well, that brings us to the next part of our agenda. We appreciate uh, the the patience on folks. We had a bunch of forms to get through. So up up we have next is uh, Pulte Homes of New England, a notice of intent for 90 Maple Street. So we may want to bring up some more chairs 
to the table here if we could. Um, if you've got a couple of you going up there, that'd be great. We do. Yeah. All right. We also have a couple boards that we may use Please. to replace. Do you think we should? I think. Do you have camera right here in the corner? Would you say or? Would be best, yeah. With a little angle like yeah, that, so would be perfect. That's right. Yeah, and the camera get, gets it. Can we get the tripod for them to hang no, things on? Oh, right. you've got one. Can, Terrific. Can we also establish what this is, and sort of what the purpose of this is? Because I had thought we were just talking about a warrant article. Yeah, so that's what we're doing. Is Warren Arc, we want to give us some bad. I guess you want to show us. This looks a lot. Yeah, like I'll be a, what you're doing, a Mr. Chair. I'll be as brief as you'd like me to be. Um, I, I do have uh, a presentation prepared, but it, it's condensed, or I, I it's well, up really at your pleasure. Well, you have half an hour, um, I think, is what we allotted for this, right? Mr. Chairman, yeah. I'd like a full presentation. I, I have not been to other presentations. I've watched them on TV, but I'd like to to learn about it. I feel I owe it to the community to be thoroughly on top of this. Yeah. Right. And so I think it's in the best interest also of the community to give them a full, fair, and complete hearing, allow them to present uh, that's, I mean, anything that's they want to present. That's, that's exactly the point I wanted to make. We're not having a hearing. This this is a informal presentation, right? This is in, in information. I just want to make sure yeah, for, that for, at least for, at this table uh, uh, and the audience is yeah, clear just, of what's just, going on. Just, okay. just so you're clear. We're, we're, we're not taking any positions tonight other than one of the things we have to determine as a result of this, I think, is you all want to get a warrant article. You want to get an article on the warrant for a zoning change at, for annual town meeting. That's the end result of what we do. We control the warrant. There, You represent the proponent of this warrant article yet to be determined. We have a notice of intent from you, mm -hmm. and you'll introduce yourselves in your calls. Yes, um, we don't take, the, you know, typically the way the process, at least the process that uh, I've experienced last go around, last town meeting, and what I envision this town meeting, is that we get information, we get a fact, understanding. I'm of the mind, personally speaking, now as one member, um, that any article that uh, makes sense uh, I take that back. Any article that folks want to put before the voters, I don't want to impede the opportunity for that to go forward. Doesn't mean I necessarily support it. And it's not until sometime later in the game that this board actually decides whether we decide whether we want to support something or not. But that doesn't prevent it from being on the warrant. Just so you're clear, yeah. from my perspective, we're okay. we're here to learn about the process okay. and whatever that is. Um, we're ready and willing to So why to don't you introduce that. who you are and just tell us what you're here and then, then we'll we'll listen and ask questions as we go along. Thank Anything you. further to add at this point, gents? But just so that they understand, um, you've got a super board here. You've got a, a guy who's been the chairman of the <coughs> Board of Appeals for a long time, no zoning. You've got a guy here who's uh, got great financial acumen, he knows numbers and projections and I'm a municipal lawyer so you've unlike what you might have run into the usual development you've got some some uh, uh, pretty pretty a pretty good team of people here we're gonna give this a, in a fair look and a fair shot I appreciate that If I, if I may? Please. Um, thank you. So, so my name, if anybody cannot hear me, please um, speak up. I don't have a, a hold. Um, my name is Mark Mastriani. I'm here on behalf of Pulte Homes. And with me tonight, I have Reed Blue as well, uh, Vice President of Land Acquisition and, and uh, Entitlements for Pulte Homes. And I also have Mark Camo with me, uh, who is our senior land, senior land Acquisition Manager for Pulte Homes. Uh, and I'm a land entitlement manager for Pulte Homes as well. So uh, I've been with Pulte Homes for 10 years now. Uh, Mark is uh, over 15 years and Reed is uh, 20 years. So, um, you know, we have a lot of experience developing residential projects uh, in Massachusetts and we hope to be able to use our expertise to bring a project uh, to your town as well in order to work together and, and develop a high quality residential project. Um, so we're here tonight because, as you mentioned, we did file a, a warrant, uh, 2014 warrant for notice of intent yep. in order to develop 
in order to construct a, a senior housing residential development. So going back a little in time, um, the parcel that we're talking about is located at 90 Maple Street. Uh, we were approached earlier uh, in 2013 about the possibility, uh, we were approached by a, uh, a commission in town, uh, a um, committee in town, uh, about the possibility of developing a high quality residential development in town that would um, be able to generate, potentially, potentially generate some additional revenue for the town. You know, we're aware there have, have been discussions about different options, different alternatives about how to generate some additional revenue in town. And uh, one of the ways to do that is by um, developing residential housing. So um, we had those discussions and subsequent to that, uh, we, we reviewed all of the land in town and we drove around uh, Sherborne and looked at available parcels of land where we would be able to develop a high quality residential development. And subsequent to that, we were able to work with um, to work out an agreement with the Gray family. And Pulte Homes has under agreement uh, about 90 acres of land at 90 Maple Street um, to build a residential housing development. Uh, the site is, uh, to orient everybody, it's um, to the west of where we are t today, at the intersection of 16 and Maple Street. And it's about halfway down Maple Street on the north side um, and to the west is, is Western Ave. Uh, the site has frontage and is accessed off of Maple Street. So now that we have the, the parcel under agreement and in control, um, our next step was to, was to decide what can we do here? You know, what, are, what are the housing options available for this, for this site? So we re reviewed your zoning, you know, we went through your community development plan and we had a meeting with uh, town staff. And based on all of those discussions, it became, um, became clear to us, or it was our um, conclusion that the best and most benign uh, residential option uh, for the site would be a senior residential housing development. It would provide the most uh, revenue to the town. It comes with the least amount of impacts to the town. Uh, and it's something that our company is very experienced at. We've done many, many senior housing developments in this, in this general area. Um, and it, it seemed to be a good win-win for the, for the town of Sherborne and for us, and that was something that we would be able to provide. So um, that's why we're here tonight. In order to do a senior housing development at 90 Maple Street, the site is currently zoned resident, residential B, which allows for single family housing and we need to come before the town uh, at a town meeting uh, for the town to rezone the property to your existing zoning uh, overlay, which is called a uh, senior, senior residence EA zoning overlay, which would allow a, a um, senior housing uh, condominium project. So um, that's why we're here tonight. We need to get on the warrant and we need to come before the town get the town support for this type of development um, in order to get the zoning on it. And then once the zoning is on it, we would go back to the local boards and commissions to do a more definitive plan. I understand you made some changes recently. We did, we did, so. In response to comments from the community. We did, so this is, this is kind of an overall locust map. And now I'm gonna flip this around. And in your packet here is an updated, uh, still conceptual plan. So uh, Maple Street running east-west is, is down here. Uh, an adjacent uh, residential neighborhood is Wildwood Drive. It's over here. Uh, this is a, an updated conceptual plan. And I'll go through the, the changes um, kind of at the end here. But there's a total of 66 uh, condominium homes. They would be for sale, for sale homes. This is not a rental development. Um, the total parcel site is uh, about plus or minus 90 acres and 66 homes. So the density is, is under one unit per acre. Uh, the zoning of the uh, residence EA is four units per acre. So um, you know, we believe this is a, um, a reasonable amount of uh, units for a, a land parcel of this size. 
Uh, each of the homes are proposed with two bedrooms, and they would have a master bedroom on the first floor. So uh, design geared for, for seniors who would be the buyer of, of these homes. Um, the, the homes would be approximately 1,900 square feet uh, to 2,500 square feet would have two car attached garages and private decks, um, most with um, really nice views, scenic views of uh, open space area to the rear. Yeah, so this would be a, a, a senior housing development, so it would be age restricted, <coughs> deep restricted, where one member of the household would have to be uh, age 55 years of age or older, and that is uh, consistent with the with the requirements in the, in the town's um, zoning. Uh, the benefits, um, so one of the other benefits of doing uh, condominium um, senior housing development is the ability to create large uh, contiguous parcels of open space. So as you can see on this open space, uh, or as on this conceptual plan, um, we've clustered our units in the, in the uh, general uh, center of the site and it allows uh, large areas of open space to the east, to the west, uh, to, con to connect with um, other existing <coughs> town parcels of open space. Um, part, of our part of our proposal is also to have, um, there's significant amounts of existing trails out on the, on the site, and part of our proposal is those are very important to the town. They've been used for many, many decades and um, we're certainly willing to keep them open to the public, keep them active, uh, make new trail connections where we need to um, in order to preserve the, you know, the use in the, of the trail network that's there today. And a clustered development such as the one you're looking at uh, helps to maintain the rural nature of, of your town, of Sherborne. Um, you know, again, the, the parcel is 90 acres I actually have a couple uh, exhibits too, but what we're looking at is a greater than 60% of the site would remain open space and its existing natural condition, and 40% um, and of the site would be used um, in, for development purposes. And um, the, the, the zoning requires 25% uh, open space. So we're proposing and we're committed to providing much more open space than what's actually required by zoning. So I did actually have a couple boards that I wanted to just present because I think it's a, it's a significant benefit of a project, of this project. And we know we need town support and we know we need to build a high quality project uh, that the town will, will stand behind and will, and will want. So this is an open space plan um, prepared just to kind of show everybody um, the, the ability to, to maintain the open space of the site. So this dark green here is uh, large continu contiguous parcels of open space. And the yellow is what we're calling the building envelope. Uh, and right now it's much bigger than actually what we really need. Although the, <clears throat> the intent of this plan is to kind of, um, is to leave flexibility for the planning board and the conservation commission and the board of health to, to make changes or to make revisions because we're at the beginning stage of this process. We need to get the rezoning and then we need to go back before the planning board and, and the other boards in town to do the definitive <coughs> plan. So we want to leave flexibility for the other members of town to um, make recommendations and changes and, and so that's, that's what the intent of this plan was. And it's on the back, is that based on some of the previous hearings we've had, uh, there was a lot of uh, people in the audience who wanted to know, well, what about the trails? You know, where are they? How are they going to be maintained? And so we put this exhibit together to, to show uh, where the existing trails are on site, and those are shown in red, and where we would create new proposed trails in <coughs> order to, con to create a continuous network, usable network of um, of trails uh, for the, for our homeowners it would certainly be a great benefit to, <coughs> to our customers and also to the, the town as a whole, the people who use the trails uh, every day. 
Mark, right, before you move on, could you just uh, uh, talk briefly about the septic and the water supply plan that you're, you've got in this current plan? Sure. So the septic would be was proposed by an on-site septic system <coughs> that would be designed and, and reviewed and approved by the, the Board of Health under the local Board of Health guidelines, regulations. Uh, we have been out there uh, recently this month uh, with um, the agent doing official um, soil perk testing. Uh, we've tested uh, this area over here greatly and we found a lot of um, usable soil testing that meets the Board of Health um, guidelines. Uh, we do need to do additional testing. We actually submitted that application today. Um, so we will be going back out uh, as soon as we can, I think it's in January, to do additional testing in order to get enough area to serve our home. So we are slated to do that. But you're not going to do 66 septic systems and 66 wells. No, this would be a, a, our current plan is to do a one or two um, common septic systems. So there would not be a septic system for each home. There would be there would be a common septic system here. We have another potential area that looks good over here that may serve, and, and maybe one you know here that would serve large groups of homes based on based on the testing that that. Right. Would and so likewise on your plan for water supply. So on the water supply, we're we're um, proposing wells again under the review and uh, approval process of the Board of Health, and we're looking to do. Um, multiple wells on site to service um, groups of, of homes. I think um, according to DEP, the, the maximum number of homes I could put on a well is six before I hit the, the threshold to go to a, a public water supply. So we're looking to do that. And so you, as far as process goes, you're working with the Board of Health already looking at all of uh, this, both the septic, uh, uh, from what I understand, are you also looking at the, with the Board of Health on the water issue of this multiple units from, you know, one well type of strategy, even before we get to town meeting, you know, which mm -hmm. would be, you know, late in April, um, just so that there will be more information available to the voters at town meeting <coughs> as a result of that, those efforts, I would presume. But, but I also heard you say that you, you won't be finalizing your plan, that effort will likely take place after town meeting. Yeah, that would be Subject after. to approval, the zoning approval. That's right, because this type of proposal cannot be built without town meeting, the rezoning. So um, it's, you know, it's not feasible to go all the way down and produce construction level plans or you know, com complete detailed plans right. until you actually get the zoning and then the process sends it back to your local boards to actually finalize the designs. But uh, we did meet with the Board of Health and we, we discussed um, our intent to do the, to do the multiple And wells. you met with the planning board as well, is that correct? Yeah, no, yeah, no, no. What about uh, emergency access? So that looks like a pretty long, is it a half mile, the, the road in there to the back? Is, it is. is there another way, another way out or is it just all a big cul-de-sac? Yeah, right. Right now, um, it's just one big long cul-de-sac. It's a it's a driveway. It's not a town. It's going to be a privately owned, maintained road, a condominium development. Uh, it's not to be a publicly accepted street. Well, but you still want fire trucks to get back there and ambulances. We do. Early. We do. Uh, this this parcel has one way in and one way out. It's access off its Maple Street. Uh, it does not connect to any other um, parcel. Any other. There's no frontage on any other road. <clears throat> but our concern would be that if a tree fell across the, the uh, road, mm -hmm. all those people would be trapped. Mm -hmm. And if someone was having a heart attack or there was a mm -hmm. fire, that would be a very unpleasant consequence. Right. That's th why we limit the length of the roads so that we can get emergency vehicles in there. Do you own down to that corner here? Down here? Yes. Yeah, this, this piece right That's here. all your That's furniture. Your furniture. Yeah. 
So you could have a loop that comes back in, into there? Yeah, there's probably some well and There would be. Actually, I, I, I failed to mention, and this is an updated consensual plan from, from some prior hearings that we had. And um, one of the changes that we made was the previous conceptual plan actually showed the access drive coming in um, this way. There's an existing farm path out there now that the owner's been accessing the upland um, for generations. And that was originally the, the way we thought would be the best way in to minimize the, the wetland impacts, really, that are up front to get to the rear. Uh, and since then, we've done some more research and property line work, and we learned that our property line had, had moved over a little bit more, and that there's a, there's a, a neck or a narrow, narrower crossing on the western part of the site, which only, would only allow, which would only need one wetland crossing. So we've, we've since proposed the access route that's true on that side because it would minimize the impact. So um, we could bring another road down there. I mean, they're far enough apart. I, you know, I think you gain the benefit of the fire department. They would probably like that. But then you would probably have um, bigger issues with the conservation commission. So it's sort of a balancing act, and I don't have the best answer you know, for that. And certainly, you know, feedback from. Right. But public safety is really important, and we've gone through in this community quite an education curve where we have a school at the end of a long road, mm -hmm. and our public safety officials have become quite articulate and quite adamant. You have a tree that falls, a pole that falls, you have an automobile accident, and then suddenly none of those people can get out. And if you throw in snow or hurricane or bad weather, people could be trapped there for a very long time. I, I just think it's, it's, yeah, it's something it's, to, to it's think something about. Different. For sure. That's right. And maybe talk to the fire chief. Pretty important. Others. Yeah. Yeah, Mr. So. Chairman, Green Blue, uh, just wanted to clarify uh, the, the, the meetings that have been mentioned with other boards that they've been. Um, uh, Informal meetings, uh, you know, nothing, not, we've made no formal applications, so as far as these types of details like are coming up now, there are uh, things that we've talked about internally, and we've gotten some feedback from not only some of the board members that we talked to, planning, conservation, uh, revenue development committee, uh, uh, and, and some other folks. Council on Aging. Council on Aging, thank you. Yep. So we've gotten some informal input, I just want to, you know, be clear about that, that that it was, it's very much in the formative stages. Right. So some of the things like you just mentioned, the, the access, uh, even though it is a, a one common driveway, um, it's, it's something that we've looked at, but as Mark mentioned, you know, there's, there's trade-offs, there's give and take between you know, the various stakeholders, if you will, from the various commissions. One commission, conservation, for example, looks you know, very closely at their area of concern which has to do with wetlands and resource areas as opposed to perhaps public safety might have a different priority. Hopefully you can get them, you know, to, to come to a, an agreement where it suits both parties, but each party may need to give a little. And honestly, we we haven't gone there yet, so there's a long way to go. Oh, so I appreciate that. It's zoning first and then we get into the, the engineering details. Yeah. Well, could, I, could I ask a sort of a similar question? That when I look at the uh, drawings, I see <coughs> some of the buildings are, are together. So it looks mm -hmm. like they're duplexes mm -hmm. in here. Is that a change from what you had before? Yeah, that, that again is um, uh, some of the comments that we've received, uh, informal comments, were um, to potentially offer additional um, types of housing varieties options to the seniors. You know, this is a critical need. And there was 66 detached homes under the original plan. Uh, and one of the comments we received from the Council on Aging, and it also came up again at the planning board, was to consider um, broadening that, um, that option and, and providing more additional types of housing um, for the seniors. And so this plan here has um, detached units, and we, we have added in uh, duplex units as well. How many duplexes? This one has 24 duplexes. Yeah. 12 buildings. 12 buildings with 42 detached units. The issue with the Council on Aging 
in part related to the price point that you were <coughs> designing these so that they would be priced pretty high and at the market whereas our perceived need in the town was for housing that people could downsize to and what you had been proposing sometimes was more expensive than the houses that people were trying to downsize mm. from. And would this duplex formula now provide lower cost housing? Well, I think it will provide a wider range of cost of housing. So <coughs> there, will, there will be a premium on the detached units and there would be a uh, a value to the detached or to the attached units. So I think there would be a, a greater range of pricing. So there would be lower priced homes and then there would be higher priced homes. Um, but, you know, what are those it's prices? hard to say exactly what the prices would be because they're really, they're, they're market rate homes and um, they will sell for what the market will, what will bear at the time that we go to construction. and. You know, and our projections, you know, show that the prices, they're, they're going to sell for, you know, right now we're projecting $650,000 as an average. As an average yeah. But, you know, that means there will be homes in the 500,000s and there will be homes that are greater than 650. And I can't tell you exactly what that is, but that, that's, that sounds reasonable. And it's hard to, it's hard to, um, saying differently you know, at this time. But I think the duplex units would add to a, a greater housing variety. Would you be willing to provide affordable units in this development? We, we haven't considered that yet. I and mean, we haven't, this, that would be the first time I've heard that comment. So um, I, you know, I, I don't know if I can answer that, but it's always an option. That, that's not part of the the proposal today. That's not what you're talking about right That's now. Not. Yes. So just just, to, just I'm not sure. I've, um, just to kind of respond directly, perhaps to your question, uh, sir, is that the attached homes are square footage are smaller than the detached homes, <coughs> and the fact that they're attached by nature does make them at a lower price point. So by taking them, by taking the the, the various homes and and attaching some, as we said, in this scheme, and that can change, of course. In this scheme, we have the 12 duplexes with the 24 uh, attached homes in it. Those will be at a lower price point than a single family you know, or a detached. But if the price. average is going to be 650, then it looks it sounds to me like, in the range that was set, said before, some will be at 500, but in order to come out at 650, you're going to have some at 800. Because well, 500 and 800 divided by 2 gets to 650. Exactly, right. right. That could be the case, but you, you must understand that obviously pricing is something we don't know yet. We're just working on a range. I think the concept and the thing that's important to, that we want to communicate is that uh, we listened to some comments that we heard, and in, uh, one of our first response here was to um, provide by attaching units, by creating smaller units, was to provide a lower price point than we had on our previous proposal, which was simply the 66 detached. As far as the exact numbers and how they come out, uh, it's, it's really premature to make any commitments, but we're sharing what our pro forma is. Yeah. And that's important because that goes to the net physical benefit to the town. Well, why don't we, is this the time to segue there? Because you did provide yeah. a nice uh, yeah. fiscal impact analysis based on your market, you know, market rate assumptions. And certainly I'm no expert on your business. So uh, based on your, your assumptions here, you provided some compelling information that would be great for yeah. you to share at this time. So I, I did, uh, in the introductions, we do have Mr. John Connery here. Uh, he's uh, our consultant. We uh, engaged him to prepare the fiscal impact analysis for, for this project. And, uh, and part of the handouts that I provided was the updated fiscal analysis that John has, yeah. um, has uh, finished. And essentially, you know, months ago we created a preliminary one. Um, and it came out with a, 
a fiscal benefit to the town, basically taking the um, revenue generated by uh, taxes and then looking at the costs, typical costs associated uh, with the services of the project, and you arrive at a fiscal benefit. Um, and, and since that time, we've actually met with department heads and town staff, and we've tried to gather some local, local data. And John has incorporated that into his report, and he's revised it, and we've resubmitted it back to the town for, for further comment. Uh, and the conclusion is, is um, based on the revenue generated from the property taxes, and subtracting out the costs, um, the service costs, which essentially for a project like this is um, fire, police, ambulance. Um, we're projecting a six, $762,000 uh, net annual uh, benefit uh, to Sherborne you know, every year for, for the long term. That's sustainable. Um, you know, part of that analysis has you know, zero additional cost to the school system. Yeah, you would not restrict that. that. Is that correct? That you cannot. You're not, not allowing anyone under a certain age to be able to live in these units. Is that correct? You can't do that. So, so the zoning. That's exactly right. The zoning. That's illegal. But what you can do is say that somebody in this in the unit has got to be 55 or older. But my problem with the analysis is that people who are 55 and older often have kids, and so how do you prevent someone? Mm -hmm who's let's say 55 years old and maybe has a, a 15 year old kid who's, to make it even more dramatic, a special needs kid uh, with extensive uh, special education costs, how do you legally prevent them from buying a house here? And if you can't, then your analysis is no good, sir. Is that true? No. <laughs> then Can I respond? <coughs> Absolutely. Yes. Yes, please. No. Uh, I agree with your analysis of the legality. My analysis of senior housing is based on about 20 or 30 senior housing projects like this around the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and the number of school age children that they actually produce. <coughs> and they produce, you might find, for certain periods of time, one or two per hundred units. But other than that, they're essentially at zero. Because the units themselves, I think we have, aside from the, the uh, housing, the uh, bedrooms being on the first floor, these are only two bedroom units. These are not family-oriented units like the three, four, and five bedroom houses that you have here. People move here for the, the ambiance of the area and the school system. These are only two bedroom units. So when you have a two bedroom unit in a, in a, in a uh, bedroom on the first floor, you're basically marketing to seniors. The reality of the situation, regardless of what may seem like a loophole in the law, uh, is that you do not get school-aged children. If you did get a few <coughs> school-aged children, you would essentially have a handful. And as you mentioned, that probably 15, 16, 17 years old, then they would matriculate rather quickly. And then that particular unit then would go back to zero. So I don't think the analysis is useless. I think what it does, it reflects pretty much the reality of what's occurred and which is certainly an option for you folks as we go through the process to check all the surrounding communities that have these and ask how many children that they actually get from uh, you brought up, I think, another, if I may, uh, you brought up another point about price point and value. We, we have, and I have used the 650 value here. If, for instance, uh, as the process proceeds, you decide that you want a 5 or 10 percent affordable component, well, that component, the value, what that could be sold for, would be controlled by the Commonwealth and the, and the area, the, uh, the average median income. Those units would be assessed less, and so the valuation that I showed here would come down. But the magnitude of net fiscal benefit, and what I call the cost to, cost to revenue ratio for development like this, is tremendously positive, no matter what the price point issues generally are. 
because it's the only type of residential development, and it's a high quality residential development in a high quality community. There is a market for these homes, not only here, but surrounding communities. People will probably come here to live as people move in now from surrounding communities. So you will always get a cost to revenue ratio that is very favorable. I'm showing a 0 .09, which means nine cents of every revenue dollar goes to cost and services. And in this case, it's police, fire, and possibly some residual ambulance cost because you do have insurance that covers most, if not all, of the, uh, the cost of, of an ambulance trip. The point being, of all the types of land uses that you could conceive of, this probably has the highest valuation and cost to revenue ratio in terms of net fiscal benefit. Um, I, I would agree with you that if the, the market slips or it could go the other way too in the next two to three years before this thing is actually on the ground, it could increase beyond what we have now. I, I don't foresee property value shrinking dramatically in this community. So the, the point being, I try to provide an order of magnitude. And it's relatively it's more simple to do an order of magnitude in a unified project like this that in reality, and again, uh, it's best to check my words, you know, or have peer review uh, all senior projects in the region. They simply don't produce school-aged children of, it, of any magnitude. And what happens over the long term is they become senior developments. And the 55 number is an average. The average person per age of the person in here will be in the 60s, not the 55. I mean, it's not like a bright line cut off. When you use the 62 number, we're finding people in the 70s and 80s in assisted living or restricted living 62. So there is that possibility that always occurs. And, you know, um, always the issue of. Uh, Special needs comes up in cost. I think as everybody, because I know it's a lot of members here from different boards, if you get an out of town expensive special needs student, the, uh, uh, the Commonwealth picks up about 70 to 80 percent of those costs. I think it's capped at 25,000. I have to go back and check. But the reality that I have seen, and I have asked educators for 20, 25 years throughout the region superintendents, is there any more percentage of special need children coming out of multifamily developments, cluster developments, apartment developments, or single family homes? And the answer is no. I mean, biology and the vagaries of nature are what they are. And so people tend to say, well, they, 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 maybe in a multifamily situation, it's not quite a single family with two acres. Maybe the kids will be somewhat off. That's, that's just not true. But the, the main point here is that these developments honestly don't, and again, please check me, they don't produce school-aged children, which is obviously, as you know, your largest individual operating budget cost by far. This development is, even in terms of operation, those streets will not be public, they'll be privately plowed, the wells are private, everything is private. In terms of how they have designed this project, they listened before they came in with the proposal to create something that had a, a strong fiscal benefit. I've counseled people at meetings that I've been to, and I've counseled my clients. Will this be a silver bullet that saves you? Of course not. It's one relatively small project. But it is based on everything I've read about your financial situation and all the reports that you folks have, I think, assiduously put together focus on those issues, it's obviously a very good first step. You were talking earlier about the downtown and the fiscal impact of that. You need to put these pieces together over time to create and get that balance to get the pressure off of a single family home over. This does that quite dramatically. Now I've got a $762,000 figure in there that turns out for a couple of years is a few kids. That number may drop to, to 740, 730. If the valuation is 10% off, it'll be about 700,000, 650,000 sustainable net value per year. 
it by its nature is a fiscally beneficial project. I guess so. I know. Yeah, no, and I, and I think what you'll sorry, sorry, no, sorry. No, what, what you'll come to appreciate is you know we have very smart residents in Sherman, and and they'll they'll understand what you're talking about, but they'll also understand that there are risks and perhaps opportunities with you know this type of information. One of the takeaways, though, is that when you're talking about this, you're obviously talking about within the borders of that property. Yes. It doesn't fa your analysis doesn't factor in the possibility. And hopefully, from your perspective, I would imagine the probability that someone in a four-bedroom colonial is going to in Sherburne is going to buy one of these units, and that four-bedroom colonial is then going to be sold to somebody with a small family. And you know, right. so there's a the the overall picture may not be as rosy, but it's still even if you're off 50 percent in the overall picture, it's yeah. there's some compelling numbers you, uh, there. What you've described is what people in my business call the echo. Of Yes. Um, I, I can tell you that we've studied it, and I can provide some information on two communities. Hingham, I'll use Hingham because I think it's closer than uh, Peabody in terms of economic uh, demographics. Hingham uh, in Linden Ponds about 10 years ago voted to install 600 units of senior housing. They, they don't have any kids, by the way, and it's 55 and over. They put 600 units in. Well, the argument was going to be, well, everybody from Hingham is going to move into these places and it's going to be filled and we're going to have a big boost in kids. The, the, the fact of the matter is uh, they didn't. Matter of fact, it went down. Uh, Peabody, uh, and, and, and to the point where today, probably we're about one year from the second year, 600 units that they built. They now have 1,200 units of 55 and over housing producing revenue. And their catchment area, quite frankly, is a 20, 30 mile area. It's not just all Hingham. What I found, and I think most analysts would say the same thing, is that people, when they're ready to move, will not move because this is built. They'll move when they're ready to move out of their single family house because they're either too old and can't maintain it, or financially there's a problem, or, finan or what happens to all of us, of course, we die. And the, the other fact is, I know it's a shock to everybody, the, the, the other issue is senior housing and, or assisted living or the whole gamut of it, it's only going, the, the, the market is very, very large, particularly for my age cohort, you know, I'm 66 going on 67. But it's still only 25%. 75% of the population will die in the homes that are there. People just don't get up and move because somebody built something. They get up and move because there's a good reason. But not because the fire department can't get down the road, right? No, that's an issue I think you need to solve. <laughs> can I, can I, uh, just, oh, no, that <laughs> can I just follow up with a couple of questions? Just quick. Well, Paul, and then if Paul can uh, ask questions. I'm, no, no, I was, I was just going to invite you to ask questions. Oh, we, we know you have a tight schedule, yes. and we're done with our yeah, okay. presentation. Do you, have, do you have, not for this meeting necessarily, but do you have a picture of the unit, you know, the, the, the actual floor plan of the units that you would make available so people could see that. I think that's going to be helpful to people Absolutely. to understand we're, we're what working you're talking on about. Those now, and they'll be they'll be ready. Is this a model shortly. you've used in your other uh, 55 and up developments around here? Uh, we're we're developing it now. We're taking the best of some of the. Uh, we only want the best. Had. Yes, thank you. <laughs> and we're, we're we're putting it together. Right. <laughs> All right. Yeah, Paul, just, I had some questions. Just <laughs> just a couple of one, one of the modern phenomenons is what we call divorce. <laughs> and people divorce, they move out of their houses, they have to find another house, that, and often one member of the divorcing couple takes the kids with them. And, and, and I'm aware of some projects like this where they become known as uh, where you go when you get divorced. Yes. And you bring your kids there, and there actually are kids there. We could, I could talk to you offline about some of those projects. <laughs> But I, I'm very much in favor of, of providing uh, economic uh, benefit to the community. But also, you, the other thing I wanted to draw attention to, your analysis is based on 66 units. And if I or the community should think maybe that's a little too dense for the site, and then maybe we need a, a smaller number, your numbers change. Oh, 
Oh, absolutely. And so when you dangle 700,000 of benefits in front of us, when you actually throw in the dynamics of, of divorce in Sherburn and, I mean, not that um, we don't like to see that happen, but it is a phenomenon in this community. And when you th throw in the, the idea that this is a fairly dense development and the stuff that I could say about traffic and all of that stuff, the effect on Maple Street, uh, if this turned out to be a smaller project as finally permitted and built, your, your numbers are, are off. The, the, the net fiscal benefit <coughs> number would come down. The intrinsic value of the cost to revenue ratio would still say about 0 0.09 or 0 0.10, 0 0.12. In other words, very heavily favorable for every revenue dollar in what it costs. One point in what we call, uh, I, I've heard other phrases, the divorce pens and things of that nature. I didn't mean to <laughs> suggest that that's what you were going to build. No, but here's, here's the difference here, which I, where I think there's, there's, there, there really is a difference I think that you should consider. These are for sale units that are going to be designed at a very high end. If you get divorced, you tend to go broke. You don't tend to <laughs> 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 Sounds like a voice of experience. I can marry for 44 years and divorced, but I'll tell you, I have plenty of family members who have been. But I, I will point out that what you're describing usually happens in rental properties. Mm -hmm. It doesn't happen in for sale properties in a high end situation like this. So I really, I think. That might happen, but the propensity for that to happen in a project like this is very low. That's that's my opinion. Okay. So are you good, Paul? You got any other well, thoughts? I, I had. I, I, I did want to talk to the developer about their their um, flexibility on density. You do have 66 units. Would you be open to less? I'm. We're open to working with the town to develop a project that will be supported and that will still work for us. So I think that's, that's the answer. The 66 units. Um, so the, right now the zoning would allow four units per acre. So assuming 90 acres times four, you know, in theory you could put you know, 360 homes here. We, we, we ruled that one out pretty quickly. So then you, know, you start working down from there. You know, what is a reasonable amount of homes here that could be built that would still that would provide a benefit beneficial impact to the town still work for us and would still and would fit on the site in, in, in a manner that works with the land and doesn't impact the road and what's the right number I don't know what that exact number was but our best guess our first try at it was 66 that but that's you are willing to have a, a dialogue with 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 me uh, with the board with other boards on, on how many units? We're, we're willing to have um, all discussions with the town on, on any issues associated with this project. And, and sure. one more question. I, I have been a very strong proponent <coughs> of sidewalks. Mm -hmm. uh, even though not all the board is in agreement with sidewalks. But uh, I hate to have an entirely auto-dependent use in the middle of Maple Street and wonder how you react to the notion of a sidewalk that might connect this development to both ends of Maple Street, one where this building here, for example, and the sidewalk network we have that goes into the business district, and at the other end, the playgrounds. Uh, so you're asking them, would they build two miles of sidewalk? I'm asking them what they think about Making this less auto dependent. Well, I just sidewalk say, is a possibility. Just a, a quick off the top of my head. I mean, we do have sidewalk shown in our common driveway that we're planning to build, so we have incorporated that there. And don't forget, we do have the equestrian trails on the property too. So for those folks who want to take advantage of those, that's there. But yeah. Um, uh, you're going to need a stable on, license. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Those are tough to get. I That's mean, Yeah, I, you I, saw I, that, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> well, but, boy. But seriously, I think, you know, the main, um, as far as the sidewalk on Maple Street, the main, <coughs> one of the main hindrances is, um, is the geography of the street itself. Obviously, we don't have any rights to do that. It's town road, it's scenic road. 
um, uh, from an engineering perspective and from a desirability perspective, I'm not really sure um, if that's you know if that would get get the support. The that planning board has wanted to have a cell over on Maple Street for a long time. I mean, that's something that's been talked about for 20 years. We have the engineering done. So, so certainly, if you want, if if the question is, will we be willing to talk about? Um, participating in something like that? I think the answer is yes. As Mark said, we're open to any kinds of discussions on what would make um, our, our plan, our hope, our vision for development come to reality and be successful for, for the majority of, of the folks impacted. So we're certainly open to discussions. And we realize that if it's not desirable by the um, super majority of the town, the town meeting, it's not going to happen as we've proposed it here because it needs that uh, zoning uh, support right. to make any headway at all other than the cartoons that, no, no offense to, the, to my engineer, the conceptual <laughs> plans uh, that, that he's worked very hard at and we've changed it a number of times. So, but we understand that and we, we, uh, we need that support so you know, we're open to ideas that, that work for everyone. All right, good. So yeah, what I'm going to do is open it up for a few questions here from the audience since we have some people that came out and wanted to listen and learn. Uh, I would ask, we are, um, you know, we've gone over our schedule here, so, and we have an executive session ahead of us. So to the extent you can keep them brief and concise, that's great. There will be plenty of opportunities to come and ask other questions at a variety of meetings. You're going to be before all sorts of places here between now and town meeting, no doubt. Um, but given that, I'll start with you, Elliot. I believe this is two acre zone. Yeah, as it, it is, is yes. currently. And the other question, just what is their proposed their warrant article? Do you have a warrant article in front of you that says we have a have, notice of ask the town if? Yeah. yeah. We don't have language. We don't have that language yet. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I saw another hand, Michael. So my question is actually to the board. Um, I've heard two concerns raised so far. One, kind of representing some constituencies associated with the Council of Aging on a range of price. And then another concern about density. Um, what about the concern that we do need additional revenue for this town to meet the needs of our schools, to meet the needs of our unfunded liabilities, and to not continue to have the second highest level of taxes. How are you guys going to weigh, as you deliberate this, these competing needs? Good, good question. I, I, personally, I don't have an answer, right? although the, I said they have some very compelling uh, information here, compelling numbers um, that you could look at a variety of ways, but even if they're off by X percent, it remains compelling. But I um, want to add to that, that I did say earlier that we're very much interested in, in uh, the revenue piece here mm. yeah. that, that was very interesting. If we can f do a development that's tasteful, that works for the abutters, that works for our seniors, and provides financial relief to the community, then that's, that is something that we can work with the developer mm. on, yeah. on a lot of the specifics. There are, there are some questions about the, the aspects of this thing. Absolutely, and, and, and I'm roughly in a butter to this. So yeah, I, so you're I, I, I know this, this area intimately, but I also, once every month on Tuesdays and going into budget season for the Regional School Committee, also know the choices that we face over the next few years to try to maintain a budget that fits within what's now a pattern of constrained revenues. So right. when I, I see something like this, I, I, I see the benefit to the entire community in meeting all of the range of benefits and attributes of the town. Thanks, Mike. Yes, ma'am. Uh, oh, just to follow up on Elliot's question. Your name, please. I'm sorry, Christine Cooley, 55 Maple Street. Great. Um, just to follow up on Elliot's question, um, is it up to the developer to draft the warrant article, or would the ar warrant article typically be, simply be a vote on whether to um, rezone this to EA, or will it be a vote to rezone it to EA with a maximum of 66 units? In other words, if it just is voted to rezone it to EA, then it could potentially be even more 
um, dense, yeah. I think the number they quoted could hold up to 360 something yeah. units. Yeah, I think so my question is, <coughs> what what constraint is there on them in the method by which they draft their foreign art? Yeah, I think that's a very good question. I don't have an answer for that off the top of my head. And I, we're going to talk a little bit about how we deal with this Warren article going forward. No, but Chris, I, th I think they need to present a plan. It's not just a rezoning. They have to right. present a plan to town meeting. Okay. And, the, so the and the vote is on the conceptual plan. Okay. It's a preliminary development plan. There you go. Yes. Thank it's you. submitted to town meeting. The final development plan is allowed to vary from it in minor ways. That both are subject to planning board, ZBA approval, all the required Board of Health, mm -hmm. all the town boards the way in on it have that right but it's a preliminary development plan that goes to town meeting and they are allowed minor variations on it that's what's set forth in the regulations right now there's no warrant article in front of not in front of me i don't know if my colleagues have seen one but there's nothing for me to vote on because there's nothing in writing at all and just one other on the, on the um, issue of the um, meeting the needs of our seniors um, we talked about the price point and how expensive they're going to be in downsizing and how that would um, compare to what the house, housing prices are in Sherman. Um, can, could I ask the developers um, approximately um, what would you anticipate the monthly association fees to be on a typical unit here that would be selling for $650,000? I meant to ask that what question. That's a question. question. Yes, if you could, please. Well, uh, Mr. Chairman, if, you, if, if I can. Um, the, the honest answer is we don't know the, uh, because of where we are early on in the process. But I can say that um, our team here and fellows I work with in our company, which is based uh, down the road in Westboro, we have built many of these types of communities throughout the Eastern Mass area. And uh, right now, and things change, but right now, typically, there's a, um, a range of comparable um, monthly fees that this type, uh, uh, we refer to this as a, as a townhome style um, condominium uh, community. So these types typically would run around the $300 a month range. And that covers the cost of the association, which are things like snow removal, lawn care, insurance, um, Trash removal. Trash removal in our case here. The well, some of the well or septic costs. In this case, um, you know they'll be divided up with multiple wells, but those are included. The landscaping, entryway, things of that nature. So can, can I follow up on that? Are, yes. If 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 you sell only <coughs> half the units, and the other half are empty, the people who are in the half that have bought in. They're still they're going to have to pick up 100 percent of the costs, aren't they? And therefore, the condo fees aren't going to be 300 dollars. They're going to be more like five, six hundred dollars. Well, someone owns the home, so whoever owns the home is responsible for it. If they're not living in it, they're still responsible for the cost. No, what I'm saying is if that if you build 66, 33 are empty, they haven't sold. And so well, then, they then the owner, if it's my company, has built them and still owns them, would be responsible for paying that. Usually, the practical way that it's done is that the homes are not all built at once, and then we open the door and say, "Come in and pick one of 66." <coughs> Typically, what happens it goes on over a two or three year basis on something like this, and there would homes would be. You know, several a model would be built, uh, one or two to choose from. On a speculative basis, a spec home would be built. Then that would be sold. Another house would be would be purchased down the road a little. That would be bought. That would be but built. But still, I'm trying to get to build on her, on, on her question. Yes. If if it costs you know a thousand dollars to plow the road when there's a snowstorm, and there are four houses there. How does that compare to when there's 50 houses there? The cost of plowing the road is going to be exactly the same. It's going to be a thousand bucks. Well, no, no. so if there if there are only four houses there, do those pay $250 each for the plowing, or? 
so it's a, it's, it's a difficult, if, if I may, let me set up an example. So at completion, if the, if the community is complete and all the infrastructure is up and running, then um, the costs are, as you say in your example, the cost is $1,000 to plow the road because you're plowing the whole road. You're, you need to because the community is complete. Now, if it's a case that it's during the, during the development process, it, it's under construction, hasn't been complete, then those costs are not going to uh, be borne 100% by just the first four people who live there, for example, to use the number four. It won't be up to the first four people to pay for the entire development. So that, whatever their monthly fee is, and you know, we have uh, many years of experience in many different communities, mm -hmm. half a dozen of which are under construction right now, we do a build-out budget and then we do an annual budget. And the, um, on a, on a uh, typical basis, those fees do not change from the construction budget to the build-out budget. Well, my so it doesn't, it doesn't jump up by 100% um, when, during construction when all the people are in it. We have not had that experience. My, my concern is sort of the contra uh, uh, internal inconsistency. If you have people who want to downsize from, let's say they own a house right now, it's 700000 They then buy a house here, let's say they spend, they buy a condo here for seven fifty. Their taxes will go up, and they're going to have this $3,600 a year in condo fees, $300 a month. So they will have what benefit from quote, downsizing from their single family homes to a condo I where- think you set the hypothetical up so they wouldn't have a benefit, Paul. I mean, <laughs> that's the problem. Yeah, I, 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 I mean, I hear what you're saying. No, 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 no. Yeah. So if you have a brief answer, well, sure. Just to respond to that, so, so um, uh, we think there's a, a number of benefits because as I say, we do this every day. This is our business. So- well, That's why buy, I'm asking the so, question. So people who buy from us, that's, and it's a, it's, a, it's a good question. People who buy from us tell us that what they're um, uh, endeavoring to do is they want to get out of not only the larger home, maybe a family home that has many more bedrooms than they need, is larger than they need, they want to, and it's perhaps many decades old. So they want to transition out of that. It's a lifestyle choice, as, as John said. Whether this community is built or not, these folks who are at that point of their life, lifestyle, they're willing to make that change, they're ready to make the change. They'll make the change. Maybe not here. If this isn't available, they can <coughs> go to another location. But they're making a lifestyle change. So they're going from something that's perhaps old and worn, well loved, and they're going to something new. So that's a benefit. It's a choice that they make. They get something that is new to them, new choices. Uh, they get to choose what, what they want in the interiors mm -hmm. naturally. They get all new systems in the house, efficient heat, which is more cost-effective heat. Air conditioning, again, it's more cost-effective. Maintenance on the building is now minimal. Uh, many of the maintenance items outside that they had to uh, take care of their own snow removal in their driveway, shoveling their walks, mowing their lawns, tending their gardens, that's now covered in their monthly fee, and it's done by someone else here in this community. Also, the um, cost of insurance, it's covered here in their fee. They were paying that anyway for their single-family home. So it's not all add-on, some of it is just trading. And in many cases, the folks that buy from us, that's how they think of it. They have an asset in a piece of real estate and they're just trading that asset. So they sell one, they move into another one, but they don't, they don't lose value. And usually after a year or two or three in a new community, they actually gain value quicker than they would have if they stayed in their own home. But that's not insurance, that's just can happen sometimes. But it's more about you know, trading this asset value into something that's you know, old and big and a lot to maintain, a lot of work, cleaning the gutters, things of that nature that you know, folks uh, don't like to do as, as they get uh, more mature and more older. So they move into something like this where a lot of those things are taken care of.
that okay, helps. Thanks. Okay, so another. Oh. Can I just make it clear when I'm asking questions, it doesn't mean hostility or, or I formed an opinion. No, he's I'm trying to get information, and so I'm at trying to you know test the the uh, response and to see how flexible you are and so on. This is just doing the job for the citizens. You shouldn't draw any inference from it. It's not. Great. Not okay. ready to make a decision. Great. I had Chuck Yon, Maple Street resident and planning board member. Yes, sir. Well, I have a question as a Maple Street resident. Have you all done any uh, traffic impact analysis yet, or do you plan to do that before you draft a preliminary development plan? Um, yeah, Mr. Chairman. Go for it. Yes, please. Uh, we actually have uh, at the first um, at the first informal meeting that we attended with the Revenue Development Commission, uh, there was a lot of traffic concerns that came up at that meeting. So. Um, after that meeting, we actually engaged um, Bob Michaud, who's in the audience in the rear. Uh, he's with MDM. You can stand up, Bob. Come on. <laughs> he's with MDM uh, Consultants out of, out of um, Boston. And we engaged him to look at uh, this development, this age-restricted housing 66-unit development, and how would this impact um, Maple Street in, this, in the existing conditions out there today. And, um, I could summarize it, but I'd you know, like to, I think everybody would like to hear you. Right. Yeah, uh, without going into extreme detail, the objective of what we've done is to quantify in objective terms what the traffic levels are on Maple Street and on both ends of Maple Street, on the Western Ave side and on the Route 16 side. We've quantified uh, crash statistics to understand trends. We've um, conducted speed studies to understand those trends. And we've looked at um, the traffic generation characteristics of what, what is being proposed, which among all available types of residential uses is the lowest generating per unit um, uh, type of project that you could build. And you know, just by way of comparison, uh, while this represents 66 individual units, uh, 55 and over housing, um, it has an equivalent impact to 27 single-family homes. Right? So that, if you were to compare the impact on a, on a basis of single-family versus what's being proposed, the impact uh, on a per-unit basis is about one-half to, to, to one-third. Can you explain why? Um, the, the travel characteristics of 55 and over are different. Uh, while some of the residents may have uh, gainful employment and, and, and travel in typical, uh, typical commuter patterns, for instance, there are, is a, a substantial component of, of the community uh, that doesn't necessarily have to get up at 7, 6 in the morning to go to work in, in, in an adjacent community or in Boston, say. Um, they may either work from home, work part-time, not work, uh, may have a second residence in a warmer climate, um, there are a whole host of reasons why um, this type of development has a different traffic generation characteristic uh, when, when compared to single family. Now, the other factor, of course, is the preponderance of automobiles at single family residence. Uh, you know, a three, four bedroom home in, in this area would have a typical uh, per unit ownership level of between two and three vehicles. Uh, you may have uh, school-aged children, teenagers in the home uh, that have vehicles, parents, uh, both for husband, wife, or, or, or partner. And, and um, so the, the demographics and the characteristics of auto ownership are much different as well. So a whole host of factors that go into this. And um, the basis for this isn't something we make up. Uh, we actually look to industry standard trip rates for these types of land uses, which are well documented. Um, and, and those uh, are based on surveys of similar communities throughout the country. Uh, and, uh, and that provides an objective basis for us to estimate what might happen in this particular instance. So um, the impact of this, which is documented in a, in a formal traffic impact and access, uh, access study, which we prepared, um, really is uh, fairly consequential, to be honest with you. Uh, uh, while I understand there are concerns about high travel speeds on Maple Street, commuter activity on the Maple Street border, uh, and other uh, incident trends on gateways, et cetera, um, the real impact of this uh, it would not be noticeable to the typical driver, the 
typical person standing on a street corner. If this were built and operating, and you had the magic ability to stand on a street corner and try to determine the difference of how many cars were actually using an intersection or making a left turn, you would be hard pressed to see uh, and quantify or feel that impact. Um, by way of example, um, if you were looking at the Route 16 intersection, uh, we know that uh, in the morning uh, there are some, uh, well I can tell you exactly, right? a typical commuter out between 7 o'clock and 9 o'clock in the morning. Uh, we know that there are about 150 left turns that happen uh, in the morning from Maple Street on the Washington Street on Route 16. Uh, this project, during that same period of time, uh, would certainly add to that volume, but not in a, in a way that would be meaningful or that would create, you know, a long additional delay or queue. What's the uh, LOS rating for that intersection? Uh, well, it depends. Before and after. The, um, it stays the same. And the impact difference between the two is about a two-second delay for any particular movement. That's so the kind of impact we're talking about. You're rating it as a C? No. Um, if you talk about uh, travel on Route 16 itself, uh, that's either a level of service A or B, right? Minimal delay. If you're trying to make a right turn from Maple Street onto uh, Route 16, you may experience a delay of about 20 seconds. If you want to make a left turn, from Maple Street, which is what most people would say is the issue there, uh, you can wait 30, 40, 50 seconds, more than a minute uh, on occasion. Not, a, not all the time, but that particular movement, the left turn movement, is the movement among all of the movements at that location that experiences some measurable delay. And, um, and how do you rate that? Uh, that's uh, in a failing condition. So it's LOSF. Correct, greater than 50 seconds. Now, if but you're, you actually, you're going to add to that. Um, well, let's talk about how much we would add to that. Uh, <coughs> what we would be adding is the equivalent of one new car every four minutes to that movement. That's the average level of additional traffic that we would be adding for a left turn in the morning, between 7 and 9 in the morning. Uh, so we could certainly make the argument that we're adding to it, uh, and that is true. Uh, but if you were standing on a street corner, timing how long it takes someone to make a left turn, and on average you got about a 50 second delay, which is long, I mean, if you're waiting that long, it feels like forever. Um, every three or four minutes, you'd add one more car to that movement. Um, it's not the type of addition or incremental change that the average motorist would even notice. In fact, if you count that left turn on a Tuesday, a Wednesday, and a Thursday, you would probably find that the difference in the volume on any particular day changes by that amount, right? That there's fluctuation in the amount of traffic that uses any of the roadways in this area. This kind of change for 66 units is something that falls within the day-to-day -day fluctuation of volume and is not something that would be perceptible to someone who lives on Maple Street that does that movement in the morning. It's not something that uh, would, would create three or four extra cars to have to wait behind. Let me ask you a hypothetical. If we, if we negotiated with the developer and they agreed to do traffic mitigation at that intersection, what kind of mitigation would you recommend to um, solve the LOSF problem? Well, I know the history of um, the town looking at options for that location. I know that roundabouts have been discussed and considered. I know a traffic signal has been considered for the, uh, the split uh, that North and, Main, uh, North and South Main Street to Washington Street. Um, we haven't gotten to a point within our evaluation of identifying a specific um, improvement. Uh, but we are aware that the town has planned initiatives uh, and has looked at things like roundabouts uh, that could provide an effective solution to reducing delay and enhancing safety. Uh, we have the benefit of, of local crash data from the police department that helps us to understand what the trends are there uh, that the town has been considering uh, and, and evaluate an appropriate solution. Um, and that we know that there's a sight line issue. Right? If you want to make a left turn from Maple Street, it's a sight line issue. We know that um, that most of the crashes that happen there are rear-end collisions that involve people traveling toward Maple Street uh, because of the sightline issue, right? So 
Um, part of the solution uh, would be to address uh, the sightline issue, yeah, frankly. Definitely. Um, and those are fairly apparent solutions. Uh, what's not apparent is what the community would, would advise be done there based on the long history and evaluations of what can or should be done there. Right? Uh, the evaluations of that intersection go back to the early 1990s. And uh, I believe in 2006, actually in, in the 1990s, a roundabout uh, option was considered, discussed with the town, advanced to a point where it had uh, support by Mass DOT, uh, but it never got anywhere. Right? So uh, we know that history, we're aware of it. Uh, we're not advocating that that is necessarily the right solution. We're not advocating that this particular development should be in the crosshairs of, of making a type of improvement like that. But, um, but part of our homework, if you will, is to understand where the community has been, where it would like to go, uh, solicit input from boards, uh, commissions, residents, people who use the road every day, and to have meaningful conversations among the team to identify uh, what what's feasible, what's possible, what's supportable, and what is uh, uh, what level of contribution uh, the developer may be able to participate in uh, to help that issue. Other than that specific intersection, have you looked at intersections further? in the other direction to see Western if there are um, any, well not just Western Avenue, going up to the split and mm -hmm. the impact this project would have and assuming, most of my experience with developers have been that they've been willing to contribute to the, to uh, mitigating traffic at, sure. at, at least at uh, F intersections, but you've only talked about one, have there others that you think would be impacted? Well, the when you get beyond the Maple uh, and Route 16 intersection, uh, which itself has is marginally effective, uh, you know, one addition, additional vehicle every four minute um, period is, is a, it's a fairly consequential impact. Once you get beyond there and traffic disperses, you're continuing down Sanger Street uh, or you're you're heading north on, on 16, um, that one vehicle per four minute impact becomes one vehicle per eight minutes, and um, it, it, it becomes a wash, frankly. Um, so our perspective, and, and my perspective as a professional, having done this for you know, 20, over 20 years, 25 years now, goodness, uh, is that uh, we could study the world, but the impact of this project beyond that location is not something that would warrant, independently warrant any kind of mitigation. Whether the developer contributes to something, uh, regardless of, of a material impact is, some, is a conversation that many communities have with developers. They may have initiatives that involve intersections that are a half a mile away or a mile or two miles away that they'd like to have help with. And that's certainly within the realm of discussion in many communities uh, for, for a project that I imagine would be for this as well. Is your study available? Is it, is it something you distributed to the planning board or the, we, could, we could have copies of it? We have not distributed it to the town, um, but that is something we could make available. Sure. Yeah, you good at just because it's part of the presentation, it'd probably be good for people to be able to see it. Absolutely. Well, All right. If we went through yeah. a permitting process, we would want peer review okay. of the yeah. traffic piece and other pieces here. Sure. Mm -hmm. These people yeah. aren't going to be a rush hour commuters. So. Okay, I'm going to limit three more questions, and uh, I see three hands up. I'll start with uh, folks I haven't heard from. So, Tom, yes, please. Um, as I, I want to react to the plan, uh, if you enter the uh, the driveway on the lower left, and then you go up, you've got a nice green space uh, as you go along there. Then all of a sudden, not all of a sudden, but the, the remaining part of the project is, looks like a bunch of dominoes. In other words, there's no green space that provides relief the way you have in the, early, in the, in the part of the project to the left. So <coughs> my question would be, have you considered or would you consider uh, more green space up around the, the near the end of the project, uh, albeit reducing the number of uh, number of units you might be able to have to high 50s or something like that? Is that a possibility? I, I think if, Mr. Chairman, please. I, I think as we stated, you know, we're open to all possibilities of working with the planning board and working with the board. Um, to make this plan, you know, the, the best it can be for the town and, and for us. So, you know, I, this was our best guess at it. 
but there's certainly uh, other areas, upland areas, developable areas of this project that would be, you know, would be able to provide additional green space. You know, but the balance comes with, you know, more lawn green space, less um, existing trees and forest and open space. So, it, it, again, it's a balancing act that would be worked out between us and and you know, your your planning board, or really more specifically. You wouldn't need to reduce density just to add green space. Okay, Roger. Uh, Roger Demel, I'm a water commissioner. You've got the uh, condo association and a lot of land. It's a perfect site for a public water supply, which would provide much more reliable and safer service to all those people. Would you like to, would you consider that? Yeah, I, I would, so, um, yes, we've considered it, and right now, rather than one single well to serve all of the homes, we're leaning towards the uh, 10 or 11 smaller wells to serve a group of homes. I understand why, but public water supply, the water gets tested every month, it has a backup generator, so when the power goes out, which happens all the time in Maple Street, people still have water, um, and it's going to get maintained something won't happen necessarily with individual wells because if, if you know the town regulations say your wall gets tested once and that's definitely for history. It may be a little more expensive, but I think it would be well worth looking at. Thanks, Roger. Yes. Uh, uh, okay, I'll do four. George, uh, uh, ladies first, and then George. Okay. Oh, oh I just um, one simple question on the uh, traffic analysis um, yes. on that. What assumption? What number of automobiles or uh, vehicles uh, located at the site did you use to calculate it would be one vehicle more every four minutes? What number of vehicles did you assume would be at the development? As opposed to looking at vehicle ownership per unit, what we look at is the trip characteristic, the trip generation rate per unit. And that's based on an industry standard that's derived from a manual called trip generation, uh, which can, is a compilation of studies of projects just like this that have been done throughout the country. Um, so um, for 66 units, uh, if you took a snapshot of a one hour period, between say seven to nine in the morning, what we are, are estimating using these industry standards, these, these trip rates per unit is um, uh, somewhere around 30 vehicle trips total being generated, right? Uh, mainly outbound in the morning uh, versus inbound and, and reverse in the afternoon. So snapshot at the driveway, if you're standing at the corner of the driveway, fully built out 66 units, uh, and you stood there for an hour, you'd, you'd see somewhere around 25 to 27 vehicles leaving over that, the course of that hour. And that uh, three out of those four vehicles would be inclined to go to Route 16 based on <coughs> measured for trends today. And that, and that ends up being about 13 to 15 trips, which is one vehicle every four minutes. That's, that's how we drive that. I just want to make a comment, and I, I don't mean to be rude, and when I disagree with things that people say, I don't like to laugh or shake my head or anything, but I do want to make a comment that when this exact question was asked of Mark earlier, I believe, at the planning board, about what the impact would be on traffic on Maple Street by this development, he said zero. That was his answer, and that was it. And there were some people who kind of laughed at that. And I, I think I just want to make that comment that that exactly was his answer that would have absolutely no impact on the on the traffic on Maple Street. Thank you. But you have gone ahead and had this pretty extensive study performed as a result of some of the questions about traffic. So uh, uh, we have, and we can get a copy of it, and we can get a copy of that so everybody can see it. It was it was supposed to be based on this that it was zero impact. So it's a little bit of a shade of a difference, zero versus one car every four minutes. But okay. Yes. I, I I just would like to apologize but we, we're not trying to mislead you in any way and if I, if I said zero I don't believe I did I probably used insignificant which I think is a similar type of word to what he's saying but regardless okay it is what it is um, George anybody else and I wouldn't be calling <laughs> on you but go for it because I well, want to go I think the questions more. have been asked and good people are honing in on details yes. 
mine's pretty fundamental. The entire project is predicated on a zoning change. Mm. What are you going to do if you aren't able to be successful at town meeting? Well, we hope that's not the case. Well, I'm sure that's, that's you know, not. I just, but what is, what's the game plan? We do not have a, another game plan. I mean, our, our focus from, from day one putting this project under agreement was creating a project that the town will support. And that works for us, and that will be a, a win-win for both of us. So um, we don't have, there are other housing options, but we're not going down those roads at this time. Okay, great. These have been great questions, and this has been a great presentation. I think at this stage, uh, the question for all of us uh, uh, up here, and maybe David, you can give a little insight. They have to have, a warrant article needs to be drafted and put on the warrant by someone, and, and the question is by whom and how. And so you, you may speak to that, Mark, yeah. sure. So Mr. Chairman, if I may, we, we met with um, Gino Carlucci uh, not too long ago, and we had inquired about the process okay. about how to get on the on the town warrant. And he had he had advised us to submit the notice to the board of selectmen. So we we have done that. Appreciate that. And he had also kind of outlined the uh, the process that we might be going through. And one of those was to submit a warrant to to the board of to the planning board or to the board to the town, um, which would be the draft warrant. Yes. Um, with with whatever type of um, draft. Um, plan we wanted to submit at that time, and that would um, and that would be due January 6, I believe, was the date he had he had That's given correct. us. Yep. So that would be circulated, and from that time we would start um, some more meetings with other boards, and you know we would certainly be going before the planning board, hopefully informally in January, and then for a formal hearing uh, in February. And then the planning board would refer us to the advisory committee. I think they're starting their hearings um, in March. And we would have a number of hearings with the advisory committee before ultimately submitting a final package, a, a package meaning a, a warrant article that the town would vote on. And then it would include a, a preliminary plan. Um, and that would be, it would include um, you know, a, a plan, commitments, uh, architecture, and, and that would go with the warrant, and that would be what the town would be voting at a town meeting. And it, it would follow a similar process of what PSABI did last year, if, if, if you all remember that. But there was a, there was a warrant article, so we, we have that. We would probably look to see what that said and see how it applied to us. And then, we would, and, and then they also did a preliminary plan as well, so we would look to see um, you know, their, what they provided and provide the same. If I could, I just want to make a general statement as you as you prepare your project. I think we have to have a project that's going to work for the seniors in this town. And that includes Price Point. It has to be tastefully done. It's got to fit within the character of the community. We must have a safe environment for water and sewer. We've got to have our something that works for our, the abutters to this project and the people who live on Maple Street. And we'd be looking for full mitigation on community impacts, traffic or whatever that might, that might be. So as you work on your designs, I, I would suggest that those six points are values that we are pretty consistent here in, the, in this community, we would want to see in, in, in any project. My, my other point would be that the zoning changes by law and by common sense are things that work through the planning board. The planning board is supposed to be the leader on plan, planning issues, and they have the power to put articles on the warrant. Uh, I would think your article needs to work through the planning board. If the planning board presents an article for us to include on the warrant, that indicates one thing. If the planning board declines to put your article on the warrant, that is very significant and means something important too. So I, I, I would say the place that you have to work through is the, the, plan, the town planner and the town planning board. Well, it is, it is my understanding that the planning board is not, 
has no plan to put forth a Warren article for this project, unlike the uh, the Peace Abbey project where they did uh, do that. But by law, there's no obligation for the planning board to put this forward. The selectmen could, another board in town could, and the the uh, property owner could. And I would assume you have a deal with the property owner where they have to cooperate with you in any kind of permitting process. So your quickest route to get on the on the warrant is, I think, to submit a private warrant article which will be put on the warrant by the Board of Selectmen, reviewed by the Planning Board. The Planning Board has to make recommendations one way or another to town meeting, as you know if you've, if you've been through this before, and then it gets voted. The Selectmen would have a hearing on that. Capital Budget would have a hearing on that. Those recommendations would be put forth to the town, and then town meeting would vote. But there's no, I disagree with Paul that there's a stigma one way or the other as to how the warrant article gets on there. Yes, it may suggest a higher level of support, but it certainly is not an obstacle if the planning board declines to, at this early stage, to put a warrant article on. That shouldn't preclude you from doing it yourself. Oh, no, I'm not suggesting that, but I do want to ask you what you meant by a private article that we would put on the warrant. If, uh, the if, planning if the board, owner, if the if owner of the, the property comes forward, Paul, with a zoning article, they're entitled to have that put on the warrant through us. That's under Chapter 48, Section 5. That's how a zoning and article And that's unlike a citizen's petition? Uh, there, there, that's that's a, a, an alternate way of doing it. Okay. The do, owner of land to be affected by a zoning change may put forward a warrant article. So this, they may not be the actual title owners, but I'm sure they have an arrangement with the title owners that would allow them to do that. Okay. And that's very common for a developer to do it that way also. Okay. I just wanted to be clear. Where I, what, I, what I'm saying is that if someone is asking me to put an article on without a legal right to do so, I'm going to be guided by what the planning board does. If the planning board wants to put it on, then I'm going to go with them. If they don't want it, then I won't. Uh, if, if someone else, if the property owner comes in and has a right to do it, then obviously I would support putting, complying with the law and putting it on. Well, I the think way you phrased it in terms of a private article, if, if a corporation presents an article and has no citizen input and the planning board has declined to, to put it on, I would be very reluctant to uh, do something that the planning board was not willing to do. And, and I guess you'd have to look at the statutory language, Paul, but the owner of land is entitled to put on a zoning article. That's all I'm saying. So they may not be the actual title owner of land, so they'd they're have not, to find the owner of land to put it on. They're not the owner. I don't, I'm not sure we have any discretion if it's presented to us properly. Right, so that's the key is making sure that by January 6th, your needs are met in terms of trying to get a warrant article before the town here on this project. And I think Mike's described something that is probably the simplest path of uh, getting it there as opposed to any other that I'm currently aware of, uh, particularly given what Paul's talking about. I don't know why the planning board has I didn't sit in on the planning board decision not to move forward on this. Uh, I don't know if everybody voted, given where they live and so forth. Those are the planning board sits and reviews the preliminary development plan. We're actually the permitting authority. So in terms of, what, it's not a question of whether the planning board supports or doesn't. We don't have a preliminary development Understand. plan. Okay. In terms of who puts the warrant article on, I'm not sure it should be the reviewing board. That 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 should be the uh, sponsor of a preliminary development plan or the final development plan. Well, we also have a review function here, too. There's a statutory review function in the planning board for all zoning articles. They're, they're yes, required I, by law to comment and, and to town meeting. I, I understand that, but all I'm saying is I'm, I, for one, would be very reluctant to put an article on unless one of the things that Michael has mentioned has taken place. I think what you're saying is the selectmen don't choose to sponsor this article, and on that I would agree with you. I, 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 don't, I don't know that they've called on us to sponsor the article, but I wouldn't be inclined to do it at this early stage. I would, I would accept an article. I think we'd be obliged to put it on the warrant, and then we'd have a, a full hearing on it the way we would with any other article. That's, I think we're in agreement. Okay. Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. We've finally gotten to agreement. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm between two lawyers here. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Boom, boom, boom. So uh, how are we doing? Are we uh, okay from your perspective in terms of uh, 
what you understand your next steps may be to move the ball forward? I believe so. Yes. Okay. This was very helpful. It was, it was a good presentation, yeah, and it was great. very clear. Really appreciate your time, your expertise that you've brought forth here, uh, the way you've responded to the questions. I think I've seen that now a couple of times, that when you are asked questions, you do answer them, and uh, you, don't, you answer them openly. So I appreciate that. And the team it's keeps growing, important. which is good. <laughs> <laughs> it's been an important learning curve for me, to, so I appreciate your taking my questions. Don't assume from my lawyer style of asking questions that I have an opinion on this. Right. Thank you very much. Thanks Thank again. Chairman. Really Thank appreciate you. it. You know, All right. Thank you for your time. All right. Happy holidays yeah, to everybody. He's got a better tie than you, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Your tie is much better. <laughs> yeah. That's a great tie. That is a great terrific tie. tie. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's a perfect tie. Stand out in the crowd. Once a year. That's Thank it. you, everybody, for coming. All right. We still have uh, a few things to go through. Right, David? Uh, You wanted to talk about notices of intent briefly? <laughs> why don't I just have an updated schedule? Yeah, why don't I just pass this out and then I'll, I'll tell you what each page is. All right. All right. Diane's cold. She's cold. You don't feel well? She's off. You're sick? Feels very Good bad. night, Irene. We don't want to be in a closed room with you in an executive yeah. session when you're sick. Okay. All right. <laughs> Thanks again. You know how nice selfless work. I am. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. Uh, basically, I refer to this as um, the NOI checklist. Okay. So the front page there is just the breakdown. Psh, 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 please. We're, we're, okay, we're trying to finish up our meeting. Thank you all for coming. Frank, nice to see you. <laughs> the first page is just abbreviation for that, yep. that I've used. So the second oh. page is, is a list of all notices of intent that we have received okay and then I've reorganized them to clump them as uh, routine routine articles um, capital articles general bylaw amendments zoning amendments and um, then the third page is just a, a blown up version and um, it shows you the TA recommended the TA recommendation to the Board of Selectmen. Which is the second the, to last the column? The second to last column on okay. the right. So then, when you say, okay, you recommend, remove, you're recommending, remove, consider, but you're not taking a position yet? Is that a... If I say consider, that means that that's probably something that the Board is going to want to schedule for a discussion. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, if it's removed, then I'm, I'm pulling it off. All right. And then hold for FY16. Um, means to hold it off and re look at it again next year. Absorb an FY15 means just take care of it within the operational budget that's already been. Okay. Um, so is the third page the one with those removed? Uh, the final page, the l very final page is the result. If I went through and kicked out those ones that I put on hold, gotcha. kicked out the absorb ones and kicked out the ones that I was you know, deferring. Okay, good. Okay. Thank you. So right now that would be about 29 articles. Articles based on your weeding two, out. There are two placeholders in there for um, the Government Studies Task Force. And then there's also a Pulte Holmes <laughs> article, which is, uh, we have as article number 24. Okay. So, so would it be wise for us to digest this, David? And yeah. then really talk through it at an uh, right, upcoming right. meeting. Okay. So we have, um, we have this checklist, and then we have a notebook of all the um, notices of, notice of intent. intent. I'm going to break them up so that one section ties to this, and then the other section So the only is question I would ask is to the extent there are warrant article proponents who will be presenting, you know, drafting warrant articles by January 6th, mm -hmm. and there are some here that you've, you're wanting to kick out to save them time and effort to the extent you're pretty, you're pretty confident that we're likely to be behind your recommendation, and I don't know why we wouldn't be, uh, they might be well noticed to say, you know, maybe you want to withdraw your effort at this stage, uh, I think. Yeah, 
you yes. know, just to just eliminate, or let them go through it if they still want to have their day in court. And and by the time those come in, or just before we those come in, we'll have had an opportunity to, you know, at the jam. Right. Know, jumping ahead to our and that, that was the purpose so that meeting. you could see the ones that I was okay. pulling out because right. you yeah. may you may look at them and send me an email you know I'd like to hear okay more about this All right. one. We'll, we'll try to do that before the January 2nd meeting which we're going to start a little bit later which we're right? going to start at seven o'clock if we could and I suspect by traffic and travel that might make sense okay all right that, that's, that's yeah that okay that's at my Paul, request sir? but I think so, it helped Paul too so yeah what what's What's that? Seven o'clock. Seven o'clock start, January second. Okay. As opposed to six o'clock, just uh, okay. Mike's traveling bad. Or six thirty, Paul. Well, you know, whatever. No, no, I'll accommodate you. <laughs> seven. Seven. Seven thirty. Okay. You want to make sure you get here? I'm yeah. traveling back. Yeah, seven. Seven thirty. That's fine. But we will be getting you information on each each one of these. If there's anything in particular that you want us to dig up or yeah, okay. send you earlier. Um, so there's no getting that. around. And, uh, we have to deal with these things, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> no more procrastinating on this stuff, huh? No, right. this, this is pretty much the um, group it's that you're going to have game. to work with. Yes, okay, yeah. I understand. Great. And I've been Perfect. talking to Mary Wolf, and she, she's aware of what I'm doing, and I'm yep. aware of what she's doing. And then um, we just talked this week about um, what we're doing with the budget. Process, yeah, okay so, so we're, we'll get to just next meeting briefly here uh, down below but in the meantime we're good with this part of the agenda next I think all I have is uh, uh, warrant approval it's warrant 25 the amount of 150,000 moved to approve uh, $150,000 cents. he's moved to approve I'll take second. a second uh, any discussion all in favor Aye. great thank you gents for that um, so on the on the topic of next meeting, um, we have January second. Uh, if there's any compelling reason to meet next week, um, it would be the Thursday evening after Christmas. I don't twenty sixth. And I think I've got a you, you're commitment. Probably, that you have a commitment, yeah. and <coughs> I have a commitment the next morning. So really, all we're dealing with is a warrant. Yeah, I'd rather uh, not have a meeting on the okay. 26th. I agree, too. I get my kids back from college. Yeah, so I think it's January 2nd is when we're up again. We'll just have to be sure we, and then we have deal to with the warrant. the following week because Michael has a problem on the 9th. So we're going to pick it. You were going to so pick it. We, were we can't do the Wednesday or Thursday. Seventh or Friday. So we do 7th or Friday. I'm good either way. What's the 7th? A Tuesday seventh evening. 7th or Tuesday evening. I, I got two towns. So Friday, Friday morning? morning? Friday morning. Okay, Friday morning. Friday morning. Friday morning. Friday morning. okay Friday morning. good, great. Thanks. So Thank you. Good. And we'll be talking. We'll be getting into budgets as well as these uh, NOIs and warrant articles, right, David? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. We had an information-packed meeting tonight. We sure did. Yeah. I mean, my head is uh, jammed up, and we still have executive session, and I have. Uh, so I, I guess that's all we have on this part of it, right? Yeah. 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 Okay. So yeah. I move that the board of selectmen. Well, before you oh, do that, I want to share something with the board. Oh, please. Money? Yeah. Or no. No. <laughs> uh, the. 2013 Obama Christmas card. I did not oh. get one of those, Paul. It's got the presidential seal on the front. Oh. Yeah. And, and look what they put inside. A pop-up of the White House. Oh, nice. And, and the signatures. Why is Obama spelled wrong, though, Paul? And <laughs> he, bought, he bought a second dog. Oh yeah, this both dogs are both in there? Dogs. That's very cool. That's cool. I like that. I like, I, I liked, uh, liked that card. It's it's really a gorgeous. Can do one story. of those for us. Look at the dog sign. Can, can we do? Can Sonny we do one? Bo. They have all three of your pictures. Sunny and Bo. Can we do one like that with the pop up of town hall and we, you we, you with, with David and Diane out oh, front? They do, they do a nice job. <laughs> That's, nice. That's great. To sing Hail to the Chief. That's pretty. I I, yeah. I imagine you're pretty keeping nice all cards. of those, huh, Paul? Yeah, they yeah. do. Yeah, those are good ones. <laughs> That's great. With a little Paul in the doorway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Waving to. That's great. Anything else you want to share? The money would be <laughs> the money. Yeah. All right. Well, then I move that the board of selectmen enter into executive session to discuss strategy with respect to litigation, where an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the town's litigating position, and the chair so declares pursuant to Mass General Laws with respect to the following cases: to discuss strategy with respect to pending litigation, Cannon et al. versus the Town of Sherburn Zoning Board of Appeals et al. And Cannon et al. versus the Town of Sherburn Planning Board et al. 
Knapp et al. versus the Zoning Board of Appeals et al. and Teddy et al. versus the Town of Sherburne et al. I declare that, app, that an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the negotiating position of the town pursuant to Mass General Laws. I need a second and a roll call vote. Second. Uh, second is uh, the motion is seconded by Mr. Jaimo. Having a second, we will now have a roll call vote. Mr. Well, Durensis. Under discussion because sure. that's the last thing we're going to do. I yeah. just want to wish everybody the best holiday season. We yes. have. Uh, uh, well, I guess I can't mention a specific holiday because we have to be non. Well, for those who celebrate yeah. Christmas, Merry Christmas. I'm comfortable okay. saying that. All right. right? And, and, and otherwise. Uh, Happy New Year. Happy and New Year. We wish everybody the very, very best for this uh, year end, and we'll see you next year. That's next right. Year. Yeah. All right. All right. It's Mr. like our Christmas special. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Having a second, uh, we will now have a roll call vote. Mr. Durensis? Aye. Mr. Jaimo? Aye. And aye. Mr. Crucible? Aye. Having passed by a vote of uh, three to zero, the open session is now closed. Good night. Good night. Uh, happy holidays, and we are now in executive session. We're going to our secret executive yes, session. Yes, we are. We're going to a special room where none shall go.